One, two, check, choppy, one, two. Hi, right, you're with Scott. I'm Ganji Kid. It's midnight. It's always midnight. This is your right ear and your left ear. This is in mono. We'll give it a sound check. And we're doing madly. I'm a can. Two. Hi, right, you're with Scott. I'm Ganji Kid. It's midnight. So, yesterday, really good point made in the chat. I was being a bit flippant about Madly I'm a can. It's sad. She's a kid. She died. She was murdered. I mean, I don't know. We'll find out because we're going to read the book written by the Portuguese detective in charge of the case. A book that, if I just know my history, uh, would have been yesterday we did it. Where is it? Brilliant. Can't even find what I did yesterday on the old internet. It's weird, isn't it? now. There we go. A book written by the detective in charge of the case that the parents of Madly I McCann wanted to take to court so they could get it binned off and they lost the case. It turns out it's not libel or slander. So I'm quite, quite fine to do it. There is a little bit of uh, like I said, you know, I want to make sure that I say this at the start because I was a bit flippant yesterday. It is sad that a little girl died, it is, and I shouldn't be making all the jokes. So, good point well made yesterday. Hello, Rob Files. Missed my last stream because of time zones. Don't worry, it's all recorded on the internet, so you can always catch them. Uh, all the way from, Amer from America, <laughs> from Australia, that. All the way from Australia. You'll always be able to catch them, they're always recorded. Um, yeah, we're also potentially doing... We're also potentially doing words on stream today, depending on how we get through this. I'll just say that, depending on how we get through this. So without further ado, or don't, or do you mind if I don't, or do you mind if I do, uh, let's just crack in, shall we? Let's go and... So, so the deal is, that her parents tried to get this book binned off because the bloke who wrote it, who was in charge of the police investigation, alleges that they were involved in their daughter's disappearance. We looked it over yesterday. I gave you the outline in yesterday's stream of everything that I, well, I'm going to say th think. I mean, everything that I've learned from reading this book. <laughs> and then... Uh, it seemed pretty straightforward, didn't it? It seemed pretty straightforward. But anyway, we'll see what we think then, won't we? We'll, we'll listen to the words of the lead detective on the case that have not been proven to be slander or libel, that are actually acceptable. Now, the first little bit of this book, and this is translated from Portuguese into English on this Blogspot website, so I have to sort of accept that it is what it is. Now, there might be something missing in translation here, I don't know. But the first bit's all about the Algarve. We don't need to know about the Algarve. It's in Portugal in the south. That's all you need to know. <laughs> but the first bit of the book is a bit of a scene setter. Things are getting on my nerves the last few days, I tell you that. Things are getting on my nerves, I don't know why. Just little things getting on my nerves. <clears throat> Placing Madeline's parents under investigation, Kate Healy and Gerald McCann as our guidos, must have marked a turning point in relations between the police in charge of the investigation and the couple. The Portuguese police officers began to consider the McCanns as potential suspects, which led their British count which their British counterparts did not. At that time, the two police forces seemed to agree about exploring the hypothesis of the child's death inside the apartment, but the English police, without any real practical justification, suddenly stepped back and gave up on following that track. We've always found it strange the way the couple were treated, even after they were placed under investigation, and we have often wondered how the McCanns could have access to information that had not made, been made public. 
Uh, hello, Uncontrolled Historian. Um, the Richard D. Hall thing, yeah, we're going to watch that video. The um, embedded confessions and the very start of my journey into becoming a bit of a body language aficionado. And yesterday we looked at Richard's channel and we discussed quickly about how he'd done such a lot of content and how it can't all be correct. You know, she can't have been murdered by five different people. So having five different suspects investigated on your channel is good, but it also creates a bit of a smoke screen because it there's so much content on his channel and it can't all be right. And even if it is right, he's gone into such depth that you can't even, as a viewer, like there's like 24 hours worth of content. Unless you've got a full you know, 24 hour period to watch it. it. Takes a long time, it's hard to get into. We're gonna try and be a bit more brief and succinct here. We've done an analysis. That's annoying me, the video game music is annoying me as well. Um, we've done analysis yesterday of the overall themes and ideas where I told you what was going down. I gave you the lowdown from the high ground. And, uh, you know, I basically outlined what had happened very quickly and easily. Today I'm going to read through his book and as we get through the different bits we might alight on some bits but it's mainly here to share with the rest of the world and of course copyright and all that you know I'm doing fair use I'm con talking about the content I'm reflecting on it so fair use also this is translated into English so it's not the original book so you know we'll get away with it um, but this book Madeline I. McCann's parents lose a court challenge over the detective's book they tried to get it shut down they said that it was, uh, they said it was slander or libel or whatever, and it's turned out no, 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 no. Um, they sued him for libel, and a Portuguese court gave them three hundred and fifty thousand pounds to put in their fighting fund, which they later changed to the Madeleine I. McCann Fund for paying for her parents' welfare. The Madeleine I. McCann Fighting Fund to try and help save her. They later became directors on the board and they changed the purpose of the fund so that it would be able to fund their lifestyle so they took all that money uh, that's not lander or libel it's lander or libel that's the truth and of course we saw recently how Christian Bruckner was declared a suspect at the same time when Boris Johnson needed something in the papers to deflect from his terrible words so we've seen how this Madly I. McCann story comes up a lot in the news, especially when politicians need, uh, and it's gone already, hasn't it? Look, it's gone already off from yesterday. Where's that gone? Oh, this, this defending a plan to lift a cap on bankers bonuses. When a politician does something really stupid and they don't want everyone to see it. And it's funny because this Madly Arm McCann story comes in the papers again. That's my take on that, but we're going to read the thing. We're going to get through it. Oh, you've watched it all. You've watched all of, yeah, it is good if you watch it all. You know, there is good stuff in there, but it is a long watch and it needs editing down. I'm an editor, I know, I know. It needs editing down. It's not consumable media. And if you've got some interesting bullet points, get them out there, get them heard. It's lost in a slew of, like, and then the problem with Richard D. Hall, I'll quickly say as well, is that the rest of his content turns out to be a bit of a load of shit. Um, and that discredits, that discredits his, his work. Like, we've got, Stuff about UFOs, 40 lures of lies. Look at this Jewish America host and parrot. Oh, you know, you're veering into anti Semitic, like right wing bullshit here. Because just because you're open minded doesn't mean you should be so open minded that your brain falls out. And that's what's happened to Rich. So all of his Madly I McCann work, which is really good, well researched. Uh, that's all fallen by the way. You can't even find it on his page now if you scroll down because it's absolutely a slew of bullshit instead. A real slew of bullshit. You know, is that free Tommy? As in free that right wing bastard from the EDL? Which Tommy is he talking about here? You see, I can't even understand what he means in his videos from the thumbnails. Innocent Tommy. I don't know who Tommy is. I don't know what he's going on about. I know he's presenting from up in space with his green screen. So he starts to make himself look like a real fucking idiot on the internet. And that discredits him. He's discredited himself. And I think the people that are worried about his statements are, are happy with that. Because fuck it. Who cares what he says anymore. Look. Someone and talking about. I'm not going to talk about it because it might fuck up our video. But you know. 
violence against children now. It's just like stupid stuff that he puts out. So there's the embedded confessions finally down there at the bottom. They're good. Somebody else's work where he's got somebody else who's an expert to tell him what they think and that the other person's not an idiot. That's quite good. But some of his work where it's him just being an idiot, it's just him being an idiot. So he, dis he digs out some facts, some interesting stuff, and a lot of it just clouds the water, which is why I'm going to lean more on this. And uh, absolutely whatever you want in comments, you know, absolutely whatever you want in comments. We're just here to share this side of the story that has been hidden. If you want to know what I think, check on, or what I have learned from what I've learned, check out yesterday's episode where I gave the overview, which is basically that her parents killed her by accident and then they tried to res res they tried to revive her. You know, God rest her soul, like I said yesterday. I was I was um, critiqued for not being so compassionate. And it, I should have been more compassionate. You know, God rest her soul. Her parents accidentally killed her, either by sedating her. It was just an accident. They tried to resuscitate her. It didn't work. And then they binned off the, the body, didn't they? And that's not just an idea. There's a lot of evidence to support it in this book, which is why I'm saying it. And it's not slander or libel because they lost the court challenge. So now is the best time to get this out there for me. I've been waiting to do this video for ages. Anyway, we've always found it strange the way the couple were treated, even after they were placed under investigation, and have often wondered how the McCanns could have access to information that had not been made public. The suggestion here is that they've got some sort of inside track with the UK police or, or something like that, or the, maybe the media, and obviously they did. They had lawyers and advisors being sent over from the right-wing media. The minute the right-wing media realised that they were making a lot of money out of this and like, the papers were selling a lot of papers, they had a lot of money, they could get a lot of, um, a lot of mileage out of this story if only they could get some control over it. They sent some people out to help Madly I. McCann's parents and they deleted all the previous videos, didn't they? All the first videos of them being strange on on the on the interviews they disappeared and all we had was this sort of media managed approach i think it was someone from the daily mail if i remember rightly don't quote me on that it's just something i learned over the, the years richard hall would probably tell you um i recall various moments in the investigation this is gone charlo amaral the portuguese lead detective and the memories come pouring out i think of the little girl who was not yet four years old and who was denied the right to live it would seem that there are preparations to smother the case that the importance of the evidence is being minimised, that it's losing its force. Thus the rights of the child are flouted, the rights of many other children. Who wants to get to that point? Who required my departure from the original coordination of the investigation? Because he was binned off, wasn't he? Who is it that wishes to bring an end to the Arguido status of the McCanns and Murat? Those who support the theory of abduction. Those who maintain, I'd go further and say that they are, that in England, the suspects would have already been arrested or those who perpetuate the lie in straying from the search from the material truth. The closing of the case certainly serves someone's interests. So he's basically saying he's looking for the truth and people out there who know the truth are trying to shut it down. That's what he's saying. That's what he's saying. And there's a bit more here about, you know, his feelings and stuff which aren't directly related to the case. During the five months that the investigations lasted, we heard all sorts of comments, but we got on with our job. We reminded ourselves of everything that was accomplished, the great deal of effort, rigor, and honesty. We're certain nobody could have done better. That might seem presumptuous, but it's just fair recognition of the conscientious attitude of all the police professionals who worked on the case. You know, I get it. I get it. He's saying bollocks. Behind the scenes of the investigation, the crisis unit. Excuse me. <clears throat> Sophia is listening to our conversation. She knows the importance of the work carried out by Tavares de la Media. It was he who kept the crisis unit operational throughout the investigation until the departure of the last English police officer when the McCann family returned to England. As if from then on, if there was no longer necessary to continue in the investigations where the disappearance took place. He's saying the English went home because they didn't they all needed to continue. It was he who nearly every day opened up the local office at six o'clock in the morning, not to leave it until after midnight, saying he's conscientious. Excuse me. I feel like I might sneeze. Let's get some tissues ready. <laughs> Uh, there we centralised all the data we received. Emails, telephone calls, communications from the police officers working on the case. That room was the real nerve centre. 
So he's basically saying in this first chapter that uh, they were doing a good job. You know, he's trying to back himself there. Chapter one, they were doing a good job. Where's my chapters? Chapter two, Madeline's holiday. Madeline Beth McCann's holiday. And I say Madeline because it's M A D E L I N E. I mean, it says Madeline. Everyone else calls her Madeline, but it says Madeline. Madeline Beth McCann's holiday. At the end of April 2007, it's spring in the Algarve. Even if the weather is particularly gloomy, it rains often. While the sun shines, the temperature becomes pleasant, but the nights are cold and windy. On the morning of April 28th, Madeline, aged three, goes to Leicestershire Airport to board a flight to Faro, accompanied by her parents, Gerald and Kate Healy. Both doctors, both 39, living in Rothley, England, and by her brother and sister, Emily and Sean, twins aged two. The family's taking a short holiday, one week until the following Saturday, May the 5th. Madney Ein seems at the same time happy and anxious. In Faro, where she arrives about 2pm, she boards the minibus provided for by tourists by the tour operator, provided for tourists by the tour operator to travel the 70 kilometres that separate her from her destination, the Ocean Club Holiday Complex at Villa de Luz, not far from the town of Lagos. The McCanns are travelling in the company of the Payne family, composed of David Payne, 41, and his wife Fiona, 35, doctors, their daughters, Lily and Scarlett, aged two and one respectively, and Diana Webster, aged 63, credit manager, Fiona's mother. One hour earlier, at around 1pm, the other members of the holiday makers had arrived from London, the Oldfield couple, Matthew Oldfield, 38, doctor, Rachel Mampilly, 37, human resources manager, and their daughter Grace, 19 months, as well as the O'Brien couple, marketing managers, and their children. David Payne is the organiser of the trip. These couples have spent their holidays together for several years. I'm glossing over this bit again because it's just like, you know, it's stuff we know, isn't it? Stuff we know. Where the, the apartments are, where the doors are, that sort of stuff. Like, we know all this, and you probably do as well. If you don't, I'll just go open it. Um, what is it? Prior de Luz. See, I don't even need to... Look. Can... What's it called? Apartment. If I just pull up the images, you'll have seen these before, won't you? Of this apartment complex. Obviously, I'm going to get a tiny image, aren't I? Should have got this prepared in advance. I do apologise. But you'll have seen these images. And they're easy to find. Just leave that up for a second so you can have a look. Could the historian saying here, um, we've a link to this, one of the UK policemen on the case. And we've seen in Richard's videos work with his husband and also on their team. Wow, yeah. Interesting stuff. Um, we know they were in this whole, you know, area. This is their apartment in this corner. This, this corner here and the idea is that they went to dinner over here now a lot of people said how bad it was that they were out you know leaving their kids I'm of a different opinion I might be wrong you know I might be completely wrong but when I grew up my parents as irresponsible as they were because they were sometimes irresponsible and I'm not saying I had perfect parents uh, they got drunk and left me in the the little what you call it the little um, hotel room I remember a couple of occasions, specifically my dad more than my mum really, um, you know, we went skiing holiday once and my dad was like, right, you know, it's past eight o'clock, you're going to bed, I'm going downstairs to the bar and we were put in bed and we had to stay in the room. I hated that, I really fucking hated it, but uh, it's not uncommon for parents in a complex, you know, like a holiday complex resort thing to say, we're going to leave you in bed and we're going to go down to the bar, you know, like just because the kids are asleep doesn't mean you have to sit in the, in the apartment the way I've seen it but a lot of people have leveled at them that it was completely irresponsible to leave their kids locked in an apartment while they went just over there for some food I mean I think if you're going off premises it's out of order but if you're staying within the premises of the building you know it's like putting your kids to bed upstairs and going downstairs isn't it just a little bit further than downstairs just across from the, the swimming pool but not far and literally they can see their apartment from where they are I mean they might not have been in direct view of it 
but it's not far. And the kids are in this apartment here. And the idea is that someone went in this window and took them. That's the idea that's been put forward, not by the police, but by other people. The McGann's. At the time, there was a lot of pedo conversation in the media. It was a big bugbear. It was a big um, moral tale, folk panic. The thing that sold the papers. So to connect this up with that wasn't too much great of a leap. But that's the whole complex. You've seen it now. You know what's going on. Just got to remember where we are in the... Where we are. Uh, so apartment 5A, small garden opens directly onto the public road. The resort complex does not stand in a private area. The various buildings are spread throughout the village. So this looks like it's all their complex, but around it is not private. These are just other buildings. You know, they've not got any walls around it. It's not, it's accessible to the public. Uh, this might be, I mean, I don't know who owns what buildings, but that's what he's saying. There's no video surveillance system or private security. So nothing got caught on CCTV. Villa de Luz is a number of villages built in the years 1960 to 1970 when it became a popular tourist destination. I don't want to know about the history of Villa de Luz, so again, I'm going to skip this. On the day of the arrival at the Ocean Club, a small welcome ceremony is organised. Like They've got all the details of everything that goes on. Again, I'm not interested in what happened when they arrived. The routine is established. So what basically happens is every day they give the children to the play leaders and then they get them back at about 2.30. And then at 5.30, sometimes the children have dinner with them. That's quite normal, isn't it? Go to the kids' club when you're on holiday. Your parents want to bin you off because they had kids so that they could fucking bin you off and do what they want instead, which seems really fucking weird to me, but they did. Uh, for the first evening, the routine is established between 7.30 and 8.30. It's relaxing, it's relaxing time for the parents. Having put the little ones to bed, they have a bath and a drink. And they join some other adults for dinner at the tapas restaurant. The meal starts 8.30 and ends around 11pm. Meanwhile, every half hour, the parents go in, to turn, in turn to the bedrooms to check everything's okay. I found that really weird. I'm going to speak my conjecture when I feel like it. But checking on the kids constantly would just wake them up. So I don't believe that happened. I also think it's unnecessary. And if you're sat around a table with people to be saying, oh, half an hour's gone by, it's your turn. Like, you just fucking wouldn't do it. You'd be up and down like a wizard's, like, sorry, like a fiddler's wrist, wouldn't you? There'd always be someone getting up and down. You'd think, oh, it's been half an hour. Oh, we've got to go again. No, I just leave it half an hour because we've just been. You know, they're only up there. I can see the door. It's not open. You know, there'd have been a bit of that, wouldn't there, I feel. I don't think it would have been so keen to check on the kids every half hour oh can i have your keys if you can have your keys as well because i'm gonna go and check on your kid all right i'll give you all your keys back and then who's getting the keys next because whose turn is it next i don't i don't buy that um madly i will not go back to the millennium because breakfast is now from now on is taken in the apartment with the family with few with items purchased at the supermarket a few meters away the rest of the day follows what is from then on the usual course. Nine o'clock, the children are dropped off at the play group and the parents go to play tennis or run on the beach. Madeline cries in her parents' absence. May the first family picnics. It's not known if Madeline could see the Mayos that day. Between 10 and 11, she plays mini tennis with the children from the day centre. In the afternoon from 1.30, her parents take her to the beach with her brother and sister. During the parents' dinner, they sleep alone. A restaurant employee notes on the reception register that certain members of the group get up in turn to go and make sure they're okay. So they are doing that, whether it's every half hour or not, we don't know. But for an hour and a quarter between 10.30 and 11.45 in the apartment where she is in the company of her brother and sister, Madeleine does not stop crying and calling out for her father. She does not calm down until after her parents return. This is written by the chief detective, by the chief detective, It's written by the chief detective in the Portuguese police case, Gonçalo. I don't know how to pronounce it properly. Goncalo, Goncalo, Amaral. So I don't know exactly how he's, you know, he's not given us all the, I know this because someone from the shop told me or whatever. He doesn't know how, like, we're not in, given the evidence, the reasoning behind the evidence. We're just told the evidence. So I'm going to believe it because the head policeman of the investigation is writing it in his book, which has proven not to be slander or libel in court. On the other hand, he hasn't given us the actual, you know, uh, who, you know, who told him that? He hasn't given us the facts and the backup. 
Wednesday, May the 2nd. At breakfast, Madly Iron asked her parents why they left her to cry the night before and why they did not come back immediately. At 9 o'clock, the children are back in their respective playgroups. I used to hate that shit. I used to hate that shit going in those playgroups. You've lived in Spain, in Gibraltar. The locals take their kids everywhere. It's not unusual to see your children in a rest young children in a restaurant near midnight. That's their culture. I mean, I have been on holidays with my parents where they have taken me to the restaurants. I've been out with them. I've also been a little bit younger than that. And like I said, my dad put us kids club bed, you know? Um, my mom did the same kids club. And I don't know if we were out down. Like, they wouldn't want us out down in the bar with them while they got drunk. We'd have been safer locked up in the fucking room. And we're little kids. Like, there was an idea that after a certain time you go to bed. I mean, I remember these things pretty clearly. Because I remember my feelings of feeling lonely and upset. Like, why bring me all the way out here to lock me in a hotel room? But it did go on. My parents weren't the worst parents in the world or anything. Like, it just went on. Uh, my electric light is now not... Not working. Brilliant. Oh, your mother... F I need to now go and get a lighter, which will be upstairs, all the way upstairs, which will annoy the fucking life out of me, or I can use my huff of vaporizer. Let's push on. Because we've got a bit to get through, and it's going to be more than one episode, and I don't know if we're doing words today. We might do, if we busy up in chat and you know we might do but uh might give madly i'm respect of not doing it and just donating the money um at 9 10 madly this is may the 3rd madly i arrives at the day center accompanied by her father between 10 30 and 11 o'clock the day center leaders again take madeline and her little classmates to the beach she goes on a boat trip and does not go very far from the shore after a jog on the beach she goes back to fetch her as well as a brother and a sister they all go back to the apartment so at 5 30 mum picks them up so we've got a bit of a you know, uh, some people think it's really responsible, and I can understand that. You know, just because my parents left me in a hotel room sometimes, and not all the time, only when I was little and asleep in bed. But um, you know, some people think it's pretty, uh, pretty irresponsible of them. But that's the the routine of a holiday. Announcement of a disappearance: the first seventy-two hours. Now, this is really important, isn't it? Because the first seventy-two hours are big, aren't they? You talk about that golden hour in crimes and um, also in, it's mainly in medical, isn't it? When you've got an hour to try and get the most done. Uh, but it's pretty important when someone's missing that first bit of time, isn't it? So, on the evening of May the 3rd, he's talking about what he's doing. He's gone out for dinner, the lead detective, but he receives news about the disappearance of a four-year-old English girl at midnight. The police officer on call was informed about it by the National Guard of the Republic at the time of her disappearance. The little girl was supposed to have been sleeping in an apartment while her parents were dining 100 metres away. An inspector is sent to the scene immediately to establish the initial facts. A forensic expert assigned to security of the premises will join him. All precautions are taken to preserve possible clues and elements of evidence. I demand to be informed very regularly and, before going home, I call on the police on duty to check all urgent measures are underway. So the lead detective's been out for dinner. He's been called up. Oh, boss, big case. All right, make sure you absolutely preserve everything. Make sure nothing gets under your nose. I'm not going to be in today because I've just been out for dinner. And uh, I'm a bit drunk, but I'll pop, in, pop my head in along the way home. Make sure that everything's going well. The head of the guard has already alerted the police authorities at the airport and control post has been set up on the bridge. So obviously in those first hours, they're making sure that nobody leaves the country with a random little girl or even gets passed on the bridge. The examination of the premises by the investigator and the representative of the forensic police just after the announcement turns out to be unproductive. A concise report where their observations are written up is accompanied by numerous photographs taken inside and outside of the apartment, which don't give an account, according to us, everything they could have observed. So they're saying the photographs they took don't cover everything. This error is explained by the absence of procedures in the case of a child's disappearance, notably concerning the actions to be taken when examining the scene. So he's saying the first officers on the scene didn't do it to his standard, and that's because there's no official rule book in, in Portugal as to exactly what, what to do. Lots of people were already in place, however nobody appeared in the photos. We don't know, for example, how they were dressed. 
Such observations can turn out to be important later on. The report mentions that the twins were asleep in their bed, but there's no proof to confirm it. On the contrary, in the photographs, you can see empty cots where only the mattresses remain. Their sheets and blankets have been removed. Why have their beds been stripped? If the sheets have not been removed, traces of their presence could have been found there. So already the crime scene is being disturbed, and it's being disturbed not by the police who are in there taking photographs because they're recording, but again, he suggests some things here, but he doesn't say them, but I'm going to say them. So maybe I'm, uh, I'm going to get myself slander libeled. You know, maybe I'm doing slander or libel, but the implication there is it's the McCanns that have tidied up the crime scene, isn't it? Uh, I will have to just run and get a lighter. That evening, on arriving home, I see Ines, my younger daughter, who's sleeping close to my wife, Sophia. I tell her about Madeline's disappearance and instinctively she holds our daughter tightly in her arms and makes room for me. I'm going to skip over his bits that are, you know, personal to him. He makes lots of phone calls, talks to the police in England... Sorry, talks to the director of the criminal investigation in Faro and, you know, describes the events. The police response is fundamental. The first 72 hours are essential. First interrogations and requests to the British police for information. Friday, May the 4th. And of course, just under me here, you can see his actual suggestion where they found these blood spatters, which they can't say is blood, but... They know it's... Anyway, look, we said it yesterday in the stream. Uh, this morning I'm worried something isn't right in the account of the events. The little girl allegedly disappeared at 10pm while she was sleeping close to her brother and sister. They were alone in the apartment because their parents were dining with friends. A system of checks had been put in place every 30 minutes. Uh, an adult would go and check, or every quarter of an hour, according to others. So there's an instant, I mean, he hasn't said exactly who's made the discrep the differences, but when you're talking about crimes, any stories that don't add up, that don't tie in, they're always suspicious. So some people are saying it's every 30 minutes, others are saying it's every 15 minutes. It's Madeline's mother who realised she was gone and is immediately talking about abduction. And that's important too, because shouldn't it be for the police to suggest that she was abducted rather than her mother? A number of reasons why. One is that her mother, if she has disappeared, will be anxious and, you know, going on edge, coming up with all ideas. That's not police work. She doesn't know she's been abducted. She's just throwing out ideas like maybe in a panic. So you want to calm that shit down because she might not have been. She might have just walked off. Like, there's all sorts of ideas. The police want to find out what's happened through evidence. So for her mother to already be talking about abduction is strange. Plus, on top, though, at the time, you had a... Uh, I'll have to quickly talk, talk about this sort of stuff. So there's this idea of moral folk... Moral tales and folk panics. It's a book by Cohen, isn't it? Yeah, Cohen 72. And what it does is it describes a situation in which media reporting creates a folk devil of a particular social group and the public demand of the authorities that something's done about it. So it makes you worried about stuff in the newspaper, 
So you can demand of the authorities that we sort this problem out. And what it does is it disguises from actual problems that are being had. For example, we talked before about immigration, about how people get angry about the number of immigrants coming over on the boats and they can see it on the telly and on the news. And immigrants are a folk devil because if you're worried about the number of people in the country, then that's silly if you're worried about immigration because immigration makes up like 1% of the number of extra people in the country. The other 99% is made up of people being born <laughs> and a lot of them are born into poverty and require benefits from day one. So take up more resource than the average immigrant who may actually do some work. So uh, the moral panic here is that immigrants are causing problems isn't it? They're folk devils. Because if you actually have an issue with the problem, which is too many people taking the resources, then you'd have a problem with the people being born as well. But you don't. Uh, this also happened with, uh, I think, homosexuals were folk devils at one point. Uh, it was illegal, wasn't it, homosexuality? Um, I think that we've had paedophiles of folk devils. I mean, they're really bad people, paedophiles. But the numbers of paedophiles out there in the world versus the amount you see on the front of the newspaper might tip your balance into fearing loads. Oh, everyone's scared of pedos. Oh, it's like witch hunting. Everyone's a fucking pedo now. You've got it all on the news. You've got it all on YouTube. Everyone's a pedo now. And it sells a lot of papers and it keeps you distracted from the real important things. Um, if someone nicked my kid, I'd be unreasonable in shock, a total mess. Yeah. Exactly. Get dressed and talk coherently to a barrage of TV cameras. No way. And those initial interviews, those first day interviews, you can't really find them anymore because obviously recent, more recently the McCann's got a media manager. Quite quickly they got a media manager from the right wing media to come down and get hold of the story and drive it the way they wanted to drive it because it sold a lot of papers, created these folk devils of media panics. It was playing into the current one, which was paedophiles. Uh, there was lots of reasons why the right-wing media wanted to control that story, so they did. So we know that that happens, this moral panic and these folk devils, and it's right to be angry about things that are immoral, that are immoral, but it's about balance. And when you create these folk devils, you distract from things that are really important because you start to make everyone worried and angry about something that's not that, you know, not that important, and people get things out of, out of uh, focus and out of whack. We need information about the parents and their friends to know who they are, what they do, if they have problems in their country, if the children were victims of abuse, if the family neighbours' friends could have noticed any suspicious behaviour, what are their jobs, do they work full time, is there a member of the family depressed or suffering from depression, do the couple ma maintain good relationships, are they implicated in serious litigation, do they have enemies for what reason, so he telephones the English liaison officer in Portugal to inform him of events and request that he relay our request for reports. We consider these to be of the greatest importance and we await sensitive responses to guide the investigation. Since dawn, Chief Inspector Tavares de la Media has been getting down to the job at the Department of Criminal Investigation in Port Portimao. He's following through with the first measures. So no one's getting a holiday soon, he says. The disappearance of a child must be flagged up as widely as possible so that everyone in the country can have a good look, see if they can find her. That's going to happen. The search and examination of the scene were carried out in difficult conditions. When they arrived, the police were met with a large number of people coming and going. Family, friends, resort employees, including dogs and members of the National Guard. The contamination of the premises risks bringing serious prejudice as a consequence to the investigation. We must ask ourselves that if contamination had been deliberate or not, it can make the search for clues particularly common and complicated. So... The Lisbon scene of crime technicians come out and start the examination of the residence, which from now on is empty. On arrival at the Port Matau uh, Department of Criminal Investigation, he calls in the chief investigator to take stock of the situation. After the search is underway in the surrounding area, dustbins, containers, sewers, it's necessary to pr proceed with the interrogation of potential witnesses. So immediately they're on it. They're searching the bins, the containers, the sewers. Yeah, It's necessary to proceed with the interrogation of witnesses. The parents and the friends will be heard quickly. The first statements are of prime importance. Memories are still vivid and crucial details could be obtained which might be lost later. The witness statements of the restaurant employees, blah, 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 you know, everyone. The English police are involved. They're being asked to cross-check their list with our list to pick out individuals known to the services. All of the video recordings, CCTV from everywhere, is to be collected. Uh, 
The Algarvian coast is very popular with sailing enthusiasts. There's a lot of boats there. And it also in attracts traffickers, he says. So already on day one, he's worried about her being human trafficked. As like, it's been abducted, going to sell her into slavery or what have you. you know, it's, it's that sort of thing he's, he's worried about. So he makes sure to put that on the list. They make contact with the marinas and the maritime police. They want access to video recordings as well as registers of boats entering and leaving. He's going to contact them and make sure they start the sea searches. In anticipation of the volume of information we're going to have to deal with, we decide to fit out a room dedicated to the investigation, our crisis unit. So on day one, the Portuguese police decide to search the sewers. They decide to search the containers. They decide to search the sea. They decide to make sure they know every boat that's come in and out of the Algarve that they have registered and to check the video cameras to see that there are no more. So they're quite on it. They set up an investigation room. Um, yeah, you're only chatter here. Maybe it's my fault for being inconsistent. Historian, i am not been here at 2 p.m. GMT every day for a week or so, haven't I? So it might be my fault for being inconsistent. Also, uh, Madeleine Mine McCann might not be to everyone's taste, but these episodes stay on YouTube and become... Uh, you know, videos that people watch, don't they? So keep putting your information in there. But yeah, it's strange that it's quiet today. It's just one of those things, isn't it? Sometimes it's more my consistency that's the issue. But sometimes we will have quieter days. <coughs> it's just the way it goes. I'll press the button if you want. I'll press the I'm live on YouTube button and that'll tweet. But don't worry, it's all good in the hood. Uh, we need reliable information. Apart from all the searches undertaken, we must also examine the photos and films of the McCann family. No sign of a break-in. At this stage in the investigation, the hypotheses are numerous and each one must be considered. It's necessary to locate and identify all the paedophiles who live in or have passed through the Algarve in order to check they were not in the proximity of Villa de Luz on the days preceding the disappearance. The idea of robbery gone wrong is not to be ruled out either. During the holidays, burglaries are not rare. We're counting on the management of the hotel so that nothing remains hidden. No hypothesis is to be rejected. You'll chat to me. Yeah, exactly. No worries. When drawing up the report of first observations, and bear in mind, some people are like, oh, you got a live and there's no one there. That's bad. Well, yeah, sometimes people are busy, though. And, like, you know, I'm only a small streamer, so it only takes four or five people to make this busy and four or five people to not be here to make it seem quieter. But this is a live recording session. It's going to exist on YouTube later. It's like I'm making a YouTube video and I've got a couple of people in the room. Whereas before, I would have no chatters and be doing it on my own. So it's still better than that. It's actually a step forward. And even if I had no one here in chat, it's still good that I'm doing a live YouTube recording session. We can use it for edits. We can put it live on the internet. So I still think that's good. When drawing up the report of the first observations, uh, which must be forwarded to the District Judiciary Court of Laos, we're undecided about the legal de denomination of the events. Finally, we opt for abduction, adding two question marks after the words to express our uncertainty. So from day one, they're not sure it's an abduction. The decision was not taken lightly. It preserves the interests of various opposing parties, those of the parents, those of the child, not to say those of the investigation itself. The report by the team who conducted the analysis of the apartment records all observations carried out and statements gathered. It sets out the list of people, present and pot potential witnesses. It also includes fingerprints taken as well as photographic documentation. On reading this report, which was given to me on the morning of May the 4th, I understand there's no evidence sufficiently covering to tip the investigation in one direction rather than another. So he's not there taking the evidence, he's relying on his subordinates to collect the evidence and they're reporting to him that there's no way we can sort of say it's this or it's that on day one. Possible leads are voluntary disappearance, the child walked off, uh, Not seeing her parents come to an accidental death. Uh, another possibility is accidental death and concealing a body. Another possibility is physical abuse causing death. Another possibility is murder by negligence or premeditated murder. Another possibility is an act of vengeance or that she was taken hostage 
for a ransom demand. Abducted by a paedophile is a possibility. Kidnap or murder committed by a burglar is a possibility. So there's quite a few possibilities there. But more than half of them, or half of them, don't involve uh, an outside actor, could involve the parents. So from day one, the police are looking at all possibilities, but are being pushed towards an abduction hypothesis which widens and complicates the investigation. It allows the mobilizations of means and resources that would have been difficult to obtain otherwise, such as the arrival of reinforcements, which is indispensable when faced the magnitude of the task. So in the first 72 hours, in a more calm climate, we could have got down to the search for evidence more effectively, allowing us to understand how the child disappeared. So he's saying, this is a double-edged sword. At first you get loads more resources if it's an abduction. Everyone's going to be out here turning over every stone. But that also doesn't help because if you're turning over every stone and everyone's out there, well, you're disturbing all the evidence. So he don't, he's not sure it's an abduction, but they're already going with that and it's already hindering his investigation without worrying that suspicion might fall on the friends of the family. So you get visits from the consul and the ambassador. Information is taking a long time to come from Great Britain. The British consul to Port Mao goes to the Department of Criminal Investigation. We inform him of the actions taken and the stage is being considered. He doesn't seem satisfied. Someone hears him on the phone saying the police and judiciary are doing nothing. Now that's strange. Why the untruth? What objective does he have in mind? Giving another dimension to the case. Perhaps I don't know a thing about it, but this is not the time for conjecture. We have to concentrate on the work of finding a little girl. So he's not happy with the British already. We're not getting any response from Great Britain. We've had no reports on the subject of the couple, their children, or their friends, which doesn't help us to tighten up the investigation. We would like, for example, to know if Madeline was adopted by the couple, which would allow us to eliminate the hypothesis of parental abduction. If the information is not reaching us, it's obviously reaching the British ambassador. We're astonished by this prompt mobilization of English authorities. Who are the McCanns? Who are their friends? We don't need diplomatic intervention. What we would like is answers to the questions sent to the British police authorities. The search continues, the astonishing invasion by the press. The searches on the ground continue with the help of a helicopter from disaster management. Interviews of holidaymakers and resorts employees multiply. We're worried that it's a race against the clock. Tomorrow, many tourists will leave the resort. As for the McCanns and their friends, who should also be leaving, we're totally unaware of their plans. For the needs of the investigation, it's imperative that they stay put, but we've no legal means of preventing their departure. During the morning, the Deputy Director of the Police, Judiciaire, joins us. Until the end of September, his life will be split between Faro and Portimao, where he will travel every day. It seems the McCann's friends have reported Maddie's disappearance to the press before informing the police about it. Another point that we must clarify as the Portuguese and English press arrive en masse. Uh, two things there. One is, oh, hello, Rudy. See, we're getting people in now. Um, another important aspect here is that you would want as many people looking for as possible. You would want the word out there. So reporting it to the press is possibly a good thing. But as you've seen, the Portuguese police are not... They're finding it difficult to, to um, be on the same page as the parents there. And the parents are acting outside of the police... Uh, the outside of the police's advice. Inside the apartment, police forensic specialists proceed to lift finger and palm prints, a job that's preferably carried out during daylight hours. Others look for traces of blood, samples of fibre and hair. We notice with dismay that one of the technicians, who is working on the outside of the McCann's children's bedroom, is not using the regulation suit, thus risking contaminating potential clues. These images of negligence start to circulate worldwide. This isn't, however, the usual behaviour of police judiciaire technicians. It's obvious no one has broken in. The locks have not been forced. No prints that are lifted are likely to belong to an unknown person, nor the slightest trace of gloves, which could have been worn by a hypothetical abductor. So they've got people there taking the evidence. Okay, they're a bit sloppy. You know, they haven't worn the correct suit. They are doing it at night time. And they are under a, a very um, important time pressure. So mistakes have been made, but no traces whatsoever by the initial forensic 
team of abduction, no traces of abduction have been found. In the middle of this desert of clues, two prints are perfectly easily found. The very distinct mark of a palm print on the balcony window at the rear of the apartment and a clearly visible one of fingers on the window pane of Madeline Irons' bedroom. The excellent quality of the palm print seems suspicious to us. Later analysis confirms our suspicions. It belonged, it belonged to one of the officers who were present the previous night. So already the Portuguese police officers in their search of the room have touched the window and put their prints on it, which seems really fucking bad, doesn't it? That seems really weak. Of course, Gonzalo Amaral has published that in his book. And also what it proves is that nobody's cleaned the windows, doesn't it? In the, maybe they cleaned them before the police got there, but since the police have been there, no one's cleaned the windows. They're not cleaning off any palm prints. If you haven't found any other prints, it's, it's not been cleaned off because there's a policeman's print there. Um, the whole thing is littered with anomalies, yeah. In Portugal, no protocol exists for coordinating the work of the different police services in the event of the worrying disappearance of a child. Perhaps until now, this type of case has been rare. We've been fighting for several years for the creation of such a resource, but we don't have to invent anything. We could adapt the protocols already existent in other countries, like Great Britain, for example. A suspect who very quickly isn't, the search has continued. While we continue to gather statements from resource employees, we're informed of the presence in the region of an individual suspected of abusing children of British nationality. He would frequent a pub stated 150 metres from Madeline's apartment. In 2005, sought by the police in his own country, fled abroad. The information that the man is in the area has no basis in fact. His stepfather contacted by the police states he's in Iraq. Information later confirmed by the British police. In the main streets of Villa de Luz, there are open trenches because of improvement works. They leave the waste wain, mains water exposed. On the night of May the 3rd, searches were conducted there with the help of sniffer dogs. We'd like to proceed with another inspection, but the site foreman assures us that access to the mains is closed during the night and the workmen noticed nothing abnormal when starting work the next morning. So they are searching these, you know, that is evidence. They are searching these um, people said, you know, the bins and things like that. The bins got taken. Obviously, the police are out there searching these things, aren't they? Because we're getting confirmation of that. Statements from the parents and friends, first inconsistencies. Madeline's parents and friends of the family go to the Department of Criminal Investigation to be interviewed. Their statement should help us to better understand the circumstances surrounding her disappearance. Each must be questioned at the same time, but separately to avoid confirmation of the witness statements, which happens often when witnesses have the opportunity to exchange information. Sometimes an important detail is held in the memory, but it can be lost after a conversation with another witness. In this way, we can establish relevant cross-checks, but that was not possible today because certain, av certain adults stayed back at the resort to look after the children. We have to retrace their comings and goings very precisely, as well as that of the children. We'll attempt afterwards to collect photos and films made by holiday makers to better understand the way the group of friends was working. The personality and victim of the parent of the victim and of the parents has significance. We need to find out if they were threatened in the past or had enemies, etc. The target may not have been Madeline, but another child of the group. Therefore, all must give answers to similar questions. None of the adults possess a vehicle. They never go far, and in general, they stay within the resort. During the morning, only Madeline's father, Matthew Oldfield, and Jane Tanner are interviewed. However, already contradictions and improbabilities are appearing from one to the other of the statements, notably concerning access to the apartment. An example. During the course of the evening, Jane encountered Gerald McCann and Jeremiah, busy chatting in the street. At that time, Gerald was coming back from his apartment, where he'd gone to make sure the children were sound asleep, which he confirmed in his statement. Jane asserts she noticed a suspicious individual carrying a child in his arms. We've heard about this, haven't we, in the news? Jane asserts that she saw a suspicious individual carrying a child, probably Madeline, according to her, immediately after having passed the two men. Gerald and Jeremiah should also have seen her, but that was not the case. The mother of the missing little girl, Kate Healy, and all other members of the group, David Payne and his wife, Fiona, Rachel, Russell and Diane, are heard later. They might already be aware of the questions put to their friends and to their responses. 
In that case, they, there won't be the element of surprise. The presence of an interpreter doesn't make the interviews any e easier either. The witnesses benefit from the translation time to prepare their responses. So he's saying, and he's saying it, but he's not saying it, but you know. He's saying that you needed to have done these interviews better. They're not necessarily, not necessarily uh, that valid. If these people have been complicit in the crime, they had time to check their stories over and check the answers of each other before they gave their statements. Madeline's parents are insisting on a theory of abduction. They want to convince us of it at all costs. Now, he's saying this on like day two, isn't he? Madeline's parents are insisting on the theory of abduction. They want to convince us of it at all costs. Gerald, Jerry, stresses that the front door was locked. Kate states she entered the apartment through the rear sliding doors, which weren't locked, and the window was wide open with the shutters raised. This theory does not hold water, which will be observed during other interviews. The only witness statement corroborating that assertion is Jane Tanner's. From now on, it's important to shed light on the contradictions raised in these first witness statements. Here's the chronological sequence of visits to the apartment from the statements. Gerald, 905, the children are fine. 2110. So we're saying like just literally five minutes later, Jane Tanner states she observed the, the abductor with the child in his arms. And then at 9.30, Matthew Oldfield goes into the apartment, but not the bedroom. He only sees the twins, which are in the bedroom. Uh, 10 o'clock, Kate Healy goes into the apartment and finds that Madeline has disappeared. Uh, if, as Kate states, the window wasn't open when she went into the apartment, or sorry, if, as she states, the window was open, why didn't Matthew notice? At the time when the latter went in, Jane had already seen the abductor with the child. So logically, the crime would have already been committed. The window should have been open. Matthew says the bedroom door was half open. Kate said it was wide open. It can be concluded Madeline was no longer already in the room, which Matthew should have noticed if other witness statements had to be believed. Another inconsistency, and of course inconsistencies happen when criminals make up a lie and their stories don't match and what the police try to do is get that first story down on paper as soon as possible and then question and re-question and then present evidence and re-question and as these in inconsistencies become apparent probe them find out the truth you know um You're talking about soccer. I don't know about soccer, so I'm just going to let you talk and I don't know, but I'll carry on with this. Um, Gerald tells the police that Jane described to him after midnight during the night of May the 3rd to the 4th, this stranger that she allegedly saw going up the road. His hair was brown. He was between 30 and 40 years old. He was wearing light colored trousers. The first police officers to arrive on the premises are convinced the parents put forward the hypothesis of abduction because Jane talked about this man with the child. So... Because Jane talked about it, the police officers think that's where the ideas come from. In their report, Jane's description is as follows. An individual dressed in light coloured trousers and a dark shirt, 1.78 metres tall and was not carrying a child, oh sorry, and was carrying a child, probably in pyjamas. She does not describe the pyjamas and doesn't mention any other detail. Later during the course of the morning, the father gives the stre gives the same brief description and refers back to a Jane for additional details. The latter appears back at the offices of the police judiciaire, so he's talking about Jerry. And this time the description is very precise. The individual's age between 35 and 40 was thin, 1.7 metres tall, his hair was dark brown falling over his collar. He was wearing cream or beige trousers, probably linen, a sort of anorak, but not very thick, black shoes, classic in style, walking hurriedly with a child in his arms. He was warmly dressed, the reason she thought he was not a tourist. The child appeared to be asleep. She saw only the legs, had bare feet, was dressed in pyjamas. They were obviously cotton, light-coloured, white or pale pink with a pattern. Flowers, maybe, she isn't certain. Concerning the man, she states that she would recognise him from the back by his particular way of walking. The importance will be seen later. 14 hours have gone by since the child's disappearance. Already Jane's version is known by many people. The father even referred to it during his statement, as can be seen above. 
Jane insists she spoke solely to Gerald about this individual and without going into details. It's only later she related it to the police. Again, we notice an inconsistency. She was not aware of how Madeline was dressed, which seems unlikely on the night of the disappearance. Kate immediately gave a precise description of the clothes she was wearing when she was put to bed. Everyone knew they were looking for a little girl of nearly four with bare feet dressed in light colored pajamas on which there was a pink animal design. This description was relayed to all of those who were mobilized to find the child. How come Jane Tanner took no notice? She who at the time was the main witness in the case. The first eyewitness statements and Kate Healy's surprising reaction. Madeline's parents are already back in Villa de Luz when we receive photos taken on the area of the motorway. You can make out the figure of a little girl who looks like Madeline, accompanied by a couple. These images come from a CCTV camera on the motorway linking Lagos to the Spanish border. The McCanns are asked to come to Portimao in order to proceed to an identification. It's the end of the day. This one's a big one. This one's a bit of a belter here. This one's a bit of a big one. It's the end of the day. Kate Healy, Kate McCann, seems annoyed at coming back and made uncomfortable by the speed of the police car taking her. We are somewhat astonished by her reaction, as if she was not expecting to get her daughter back. The identification turns out negative. So why is Kate annoyed at having to come back at the end of the day when there's a potential sighting of her daughter? And why is she uncomfortable by the speed of the police car? When wouldn't she want to whip down there and have a look at this video, these photos? They're astonished, the police are astonished because they believe she reacts as if she's not getting her daughter back. The identification turns out negative. They get more people down to help them a superior team from the Central Crime Fighting Directorate. A few months later, Chief Inspector Tavares del Media wants to share one of his convictions with me. If we'd remained solely responsible for the investigation, we would have advanced more quickly. So the idea is too many cooks are spoiling the broth. In reality, he doesn't know. I don't think we can rewrite history with if. Missing persons poster is issued. So they put up the posters. <laughs> We're going to be inundated with witness statements of every kind. People who are persuaded they can help us thanks to their psychic powers. Others who have dreamed about Madeline and believe they know where she is. And others who think they've seen her here or there. A great number of reports come to us that we have to analyse and check out. None must be neglected, even if most of them on the face of it seem absurd. If the hypothesis of an abduction is right, we must imagine that the abductor has tried to modify the child's appearance to easily pass unnoticed. So we create portraits of the little girl and modifying the color and style of her hair. Friday the 4th at 8 p.m. We crisscross Prior de Luz to take note of the activity in the village at dinner time and to check the street lighting. We stay there until 10 p.m. when the forensic team from the police lab get on with their investigation. Certainly today, there are people who wouldn't normally be here, police officers and journalists, but even so, it's noticeable that there's very little movement. The place where the abductor happened to be is dimly lit. How did Jane manage to describe him so accurately? Witnesses confirmed the streets were also deserted yesterday. Why did the potential abductor choose to walk around like that in the open, running the risk, in spite of darkness, of being recognised by a passerby? If he'd planned the abduction, he would have taken the time to study not only the habits of the family, but also the topography of the place. It wasn't far from the village. He would have probably come by car. He would have sought to conceal it in a dark corner. The darkest area is exactly the opposite direction to that indicated by Jane Tanner. Did she actually see the man going east? Wouldn't he rather be going to the west? Leaving by car, he would inevitably have to go towards the centre of the village, in which case he would have to go past the entrance to the restaurant where the parents were dining, or by the main road. We walk around Villa de Luz covering all the roads, trying to imagine the options that presented themselves to an abductor. Without a car and not knowing the place, the safest approach to the village is the beach. In the few bars and restaurants, no one noticed anything at all. No suspicious behaviour out of the ordinary. Most of the establishments had closed around 9pm. The crisis unit's been operating several hours. 
The original hypothesis is still valid. Voluntary dis disappearance, abduction or death. Divergent opinions are heat and heated discussions fire with enthusiasm, but we always finish by returning to an objective analysis of the facts to refocus the discussions. I'd be a terrible witness. Most people are. You know, most witnesses are unreliable. Most witnesses are. How come the child's still fast asleep? Yeah. You know, how come it didn't wake up? Yeah. Lots of questions here. Considering the, the testimony is that Madeline was crying and screaming the night before about being left, it seems strange that on the night of her apparent abduction, she's now faster bobos, not even awakened by someone climbing in the window. We're opening the window to let the fresh air expand bell the smoke from the cigarette smoked when someone poses a question and that shouts out to all of us. What's the story about the raised shutter where Madeline was sleeping or not sleeping? We have in mind the statements from Jerry and Kate. Gerald saw his daughter for the last time 9.05, he says. She was sleeping in the bedroom with the twins. He entered by the front door using his key. No windows were open. He can't say if they were locked. On the other hand, Everybody's in agreement, saying the patio door wasn't locked. At 10pm, the mother goes in turn to the bedroom. She sees an open window, the raised shutters, and the curtains waving in the breeze. The scenario is highly improbable, since the shutters cannot be operated from the outside. So, if you'd left them shut, no one can open them outside. Normally, that window is never open, she says, but she can't say if it was locked. The vagueness perhaps serves the interests of the witnesses, but it arouses the suspicion of the investigators. Now, suspicion is only suspicion, isn't it? But you must accept that these are seasoned investigators who maybe have reasons for suspicions as well. So already we're talking about early doors. We're talking about inconsistencies with their statements. We're talking about inconsistencies with Jane Tanner's statement that she saw someone being carried. Inconsistencies with the idea that she would be able to see the person doing the carrying in the darkness. Inconsistencies with the idea that that person would be abducting a child and be doing the opposite of what an abductor would do to go to their car, to drive that direction. Uh, inconsistencies with the idea the windows were open or closed or locked or not and all sorts of vagueness. Finally, but all, bear in mind, people are vague, people are inconsistent. You know, I don't remember what chuffing I was wearing yesterday, let alone, you know, what everyone else around the dinner table was wearing. I went for dinner with my family yesterday. I couldn't tell you what we were all wearing. Could have a go, but... 10pm, Madeline's mother goes in turn to the bedroom. Finally, we're able to conclude with certainty. The only opening that wasn't locked was the patio door at the rear of the building, opening onto the area with the swimming pools where the parents were dining. So, I don't know how, but they were able to conclude with certainty that the only open door was the patio door. You ask yourself why, why Gerald went through this front door when the one at the back is close to the restaurant and doesn't need a key. The parents insist it was visible from the restaurant and no one could have walked in without being noticed. So, we're now saying... This is the thing, is that this is their apartment. The doors are here with the sliding doors. They're not locked. But the side door here, which is like a front door or whatever that you need a key for, that is locked. And Gerald, when he visited to check on the children, went from the tapas bar, probably walked around this swimming pool here, past the doors to the locked door. Or he could have walked out the tapas bar, down here, up the street, sort of outside the whole complex that they are in. So that seems strange. You'd think you'd stay in the complex. But he could have walked out here, round this corner, up the road, and then again past the entrance to his patio door, past that, and instead gone in this door with the key. That's what's being said. That's an inconsistency. The parents insist it was visible from the restaurant and no one could have walked in without being noticed. This is their... You know, we're not irresponsible parents because we can see the door, so we didn't need to keep it locked. Uh, that's false. We're easily able to verify. At night, with the surrounding vegetation and the opaque plastic tarpaulin that protects the dining room of the restaurant, visibility is nil. Anybody could have gone into the apartment without being noticed, particularly as most of the guests had their back to the apartment. 
We understand their insistence. The parents need to affirm the children were sleeping in complete safety and they were looking out for their well-being. But whatever the argument, one thing is indisputable. Madeline was not safe. So immediately we've got irresponsibility on behalf of these adults who claim they're constantly going to check the children. Very responsible people, always going to check the children. Sat with their backs to the apartment, can't see it. There's a tarpaulin in the way, there's vegetation. But they're happy. They're not irresponsible. In a way, they're covering their own asses here, aren't they? But maybe they have to, because bear in mind, all of the people in the group have got children. So if it turns out that they're not capable of looking after a child or something bad's gone wrong, they could probably worry about their own children being taken off them, couldn't they? If you're involved in an incident where a child dies <laughs> and you've got your own children and you weren't looking after them and they were up there in the hotel room, you're just as irresponsible as the other people, aren't you? So it seems... Um, Seems a worry, isn't it? Seems a worry. Uh, yeah, you're right, Isabella, actually. That's a good point. You are recording everything in your subconscious and it can be drawn out from you. But for us to draw it out ourselves on a day's notice is hard sometimes. But you're right, you are recording it in your subconscious. True that. Strange, all the same, this burglar enters by the door and goes out through the window with a four-year-old child in his arms. They're saying that because they couldn't open the window from the outside. It has been confirmed by the police. And there were no evidences of tampering with the window. And there were no evidences of fingerprints or glove prints or smears or anything. Or Madeline's prints or anything like that on this, this, this window. Everyone is saying that the only door that was unlocked is the sliding door. So... The hypothesis doesn't seem to hold water. In fact, something isn't right, says Gonzalo Amaral, the writer of this book, which Madeline Imacaran's parents tried to ban. Someone's hiding something. You could say they were sharing a secret. That's the instinct of the police officers. Little by little, clearly because of tiredness, everyone starts speaking at once. Words are confused, but gradually calms restored, and the information gathered so far allows us to put forward several hypotheses. So the police are working together, they're putting forward their ideas, they're discussing them. It's hard to understand how a potential abductor would have the audacity to enter an apartment and abduct a child, knowing the parents could burst in at any minute. Yeah, you know, I don't, I don't, oh, I've got a fly in the room now, it's going to annoy the piss out of me. Um, I don't really buy that. I mean, I think a lot of crimes can be opportunities, uh, you know, crimes of opportunity. Someone might have walked past, heard a child crying, uh, realised there were no parents, you know, snuck a head around the door grabbed a child but I think in those situations a criminal is much more likely to be you know the average criminal is much more likely to be looking for a, a wallet or some money or something aren't they a child is a bit more difficult because they scream and cry and cause problems and I know there's paedophiles out there doing the bad pedo but uh, quite often again with, with paedophilia and stuff like that it's people that are known to the abductor it's people that are known to the um, abuser that, that cop it isn't it it's, it's less often just randoms and you'd have to be in the complex you'd have to be standing near the apartment to hear this you'd have to be in the place to, to be doing it so um it seems unlikely to them either the man was informed about the habits of the family and in that case he would have to also have suspect employees of the restaurant or else he hung around in the vicinity for a while to study the lie of the land if he'd studied the lie of the land he'd have taken the same door for entering and leaving makes sense the parents say the bedroom window was open and the front door was closed when they became aware of the disappearance and again are you going to carry a child out of a window i don't know if you've tried to carry a child out of a window as big or as it you know wide the window is carrying a child out of a window is not easy so you would suggest or suspect that someone might not leave via the window like it's not a normal thing to do is it so if the people are not telling the truth you put yourself in their place you're on holiday in a strange place you don't know you leave three children under four to sleep alone. One of them disappears while you and your wife are quietly dining at the restaurant. Would you take on the blame? You wouldn't be afraid of the reaction from the local authorities. I think, of course, you're afraid whatever's happened to Madeline, God rest her soul. Um, if, like, she got an accident, like, if they'd sedated her and she choked on her own vomit or if she'd been up messing about and banged her head and, you know, hurt herself, if there was some accidental reason for her death, you're still not going to want to take on that blame, are you? Because then you could lose your other children. And me, following what Gonzalo thinks and following what Jerry looks like in his interviews, I seem to think Jerry sort of put this idea forward that, oh, we better we better conceal this. You know, and Madeline's mum has had to go along with it in her grief, just doesn't know what to do. 
And uh, the idea is, look, if we come clean, we'll lose our children. We're both doctors. We both know about life and death. And we both can have a sort of cold and dispassionate approach to it because we're doctors. So time to put on your doctor head, deal with the situation at hand. Let's not lose our other children. Let's make sure that uh, this tragic, tragic, you know, Jerry could have painted it out to be a tragic accident. But what's most important is that we don't lose the other children. So then put this plan into action maybe you know maybe just conjecture don't libel slander me off the internet because i'm following what it says here in one way or another if the parents had something to do with their disappearance they would inevitably have to invent a story so logically they'd have to lie that's not right is it don't forget you're dealing with well-educated people nearly all of them are doctors the father's a surgeon what a ridiculous idea if I understand you properly, you mean family dramas are the reserve of single mind, simple-minded and the underprivileged, right? So no, it's not just because they're doctors. You can't say because they're posh doctors, they don't have problems. So you can't say that. We must not put aside any hypothesis, even if it doesn't really grab us. It cuts in one of our colleagues. Cuts in one of our colleagues who was listening to our exchanges. Good point. You've got to consider everything. Okay, but for the moment, we can't raise suspicions that are totally unfounded in the current state of the investigation. It's the examination of the window that, provide, that might provide us with an answer. And fingerprints are in the process of being identified. Are there copies of the front door key? Yes. They're used by the employees for cleaning and maintenance. Everybody must be interviewed. And have the English responded to our request for reports? We need more and more of them. No, not yet. They're efficient, effectively efficiently waiting to collect all the details before sending us a complete file. I hope they won't leave us waiting much longer. There is this back and forth, isn't there, between the English and the Portuguese police, because whilst the parents might be trying to protect their asses, so might the police. Like, well, the English police didn't help us, so we couldn't do it. Oh, the, you know, she hasn't been found. The case has not been solved. The head of the police is also worried about his own position. I understand that. Hearsay is inadmissible in court. Of course, yeah, you know, Johnny Depp and uh, Amber Heard. Hearsay, objection, you're on a hearsay. Yeah, conjecture. I'm, I'm happy to make conjecture. Though my worry is that, of course, I get my YouTube struck with problems because this is a serious thing and saying that, you know, for example, saying that his, their, her parents were responsible for her death that could be quite a serious thing, isn't it? They've certainly taken... They probably won't be interested in me, but they've certainly taken uh, the writer of this book to court. So, thankfully, the writer of this book and the book has been ruled by the court to be non-libel, non-slander, so we're okay to have a look at it. That's why we're doing it, you know? I think it's quite interesting and important. I've wanted to do this for ages. I think this, We've already seen some really interesting things, haven't we? We've already seen some quite interesting statements from the head of the police about their behaviour, about the possibilities. Uh, the one that stuck out, like, massive to me was that she wasn't interested. Kate McCann was not interested in going to view the video of a potential sighting of her daughter the day after she went disappeared. She didn't want it. She was angry about the speed of the police car, uncomfortable with the speed of the police car that took her to view that video. And she, as the police described, seemed like she didn't think she was going to get her daughter back. So she might have been in despair, you know, she might, but a lot of people might have that hope in those early stages. Oh my God, there's a video of somebody on the motorway with a, do with a young girl. I need to see that. That's, that could be her. So she took a different perspective than you would expect. So that was a big standout one. Obviously, we don't end up with any conclusion. Dawn's breaking already when we finish. So the eyes of the world are riveted on the Algarve. Saturday, May the 5th, the accommodation we're occupying in the town centre rapidly becomes overcrowded. They need a bigger office because they're getting loads of uh, calls and stacks of paper. 34 hours after Madeline's disappearance, we tackle our second day of the investigation. In this apartment of temporary refuge, it's the morning bustle. We can't lie around. In spite of lack of sleep, no one shows any signs of fatigue. On the contrary, we're all in a hurry to get back to work. Before going out, we check there are no journalists in the area. Because in spite of their pugnacity, they were never able to find our hiding place. A stop for breakfast and the day begins. So there's this problem with the journalists as well in these early stages. Polish lead in Sagres. Hundreds of statements come, come in. All the people in the area are interviewed. Most of them are useless, but no one must be neglected. This sort of thing comes in, and I'm just going to briefly skip over it because 
it's not, you know, it doesn't lead to Madeline's uh, discovery. But basically, someone in Poland photographed someone with a child. An individual was on a beach there taking photos of children. And there, there was a little girl there. You know, you get these sent in from all over the world, don't you? And there was a 40-year-old Polish man traveling with his wife in Portugal. Uh, a lead is only as valuable as far as it's followed to the end, which is not the case with this one. We will realize that we shouldn't have ruled it out so quickly and it's still a topic of interest. More leads, still no results. Other individuals seen lurking around the apartment, acting suspiciously before the events, May the 2nd or 3rd, according to an English tourist. An individual in shabby clothing, staring fixedly in the direction of the apartment, went off in a white van. Other witness statements go in the same direction. So they've got a few things to follow here haven't they as soon as they're informed about their searches they collaborate voluntarily and the agents do their work and conduct a search of the tents and their cars no one's seen Madeline in the area in a gypsy camp so throughout the day numerous apartments visited the investigators searched more than 400 without result qualms about investigating McCann's the theory of abduction gains ground someone puts forward the hypothesis according to which Madeline would have died in her apartment and a member of the group would have been removed would have removed her it's a possibility but so far no evidence happens to support that theory so they're looking for somebody that abducted her the reports are coming in i can't verify where these reports have come from remember we've said there's a lot of members of this group and if they've got a uh, a vested interest in clouding the the in confusing the investigation with lots of different leads you know maybe fucking one of them wrote, phoned in with an idea or maybe these are reasonable ideas that need to be followed up on um so at the moment open minds with the investigation team the mccann's put up with david are put up with david payne we try and search the accommodation of the family friends to try and pick up madeline's clothes especially the ones she was wearing on may the 3rd when she returned from the day center with her mother and the twins evidently this initiative is not widely supported the british ambassador meets with the team directing the investigation the political and diplomatic seem to want to prevent us from freely doing our work i'm sure this check is necessary the clothes are you mad i understand you properly you want to go into the apartment and take clothes to have them analyzed Yes, what's the problem? It's a perfectly normal procedure in a case like this. Of course, but with this media hype, I don't think I've ever seen so many journalists and I didn't come down in the last shower. So, the British... Is it the... I don't know exactly who's, you know, quoted here as, as putting up this consternation, but political and diplomatic is what he says. The PJ's difficulties in communicating with the media at the Promacam press office... From the start of the investigation, we ask for the presence of a press attaché to accompany us and take on communicating with the media. The Justice Minister fulfills this request. Very quickly, however, this decision is contested. The reaction of the press itself is feared and public opinion, which might interpret the presence, that presence with direct intervention in the investigation by the Minister. Finally, the person retained is an investigator who is not working on the case, speaks English and has some experience in this field. In hindsight, it can be said it wasn't a good decision. In fact, after the reading of our first press release and the parents' press conference, the press let fly. We were convinced that people directly involved in the investigation should remain distanced from the media. We needed help. The police judiciaire would have to engage staff to dissect published articles, focus on the analysis of press statements from the parents and their friends. That didn't happen. The media circus was in full swing all the time. New articles, live TV, a growing number of journalists running around the streets of Villa de Luz. It didn't seem normal to us that a couple whose child has just disappeared engages pressure tachés to deal with relations with the media. Now we know from hindsight, again, and I'm paraphrasing so don't quote me on this but you know reading into what i've seen richard d hall and all that what we know is that uh initially when the consulate was involved it wasn't just the consulate who got involved this big press thing kicked off the british right-wing media someone from the daily mail um like he was a lawyer or he was a private detective, you know a couple of these people got put on the mccann's press team sort of shoehorned in from the right-wing media, started to take control of that, didn't they? Uh, 
the reasons seem very clear when they're making fucking loads of money, don't they? Because what ended up happening is they leveraged the press to create a fighting fund. The fighting fund drew in loads of public money. People were contributing and donating. And then later on, they put themselves on the board of the fighting fund and took the money for themselves. So initially, they weren't able to use that money other than to look for Madeline. And then later what happened was that they were able to use the money to pay for their house. So it looks like you've got a... Um, it looks like you've got a a motive for getting the press involved and spinning these stories. It didn't seem normal that they wanted to have a press attaché to deal with their relations with the media. However, when you first saw their... And you can't these days see their very initial... Uh, I can't find them myself. Maybe I can if I dig. But um, the first interviews, the first press conferences the McCanns did, holding up the pyjamas and reading out the statements. Initially, there was a bit of a backlash as well. They seemed dodgy. Oh, he doesn't seem right. Something seems fishy. And so people like that don't want to speak to the press anymore without some representation. Why do we get the bad story in the press? I don't want the bad story in the press. Help me. So the fact they seemed fishy meant they had to have someone coach them for the future press releases, didn't they? And that was part of this as well. So, it's not a question here of minimising the role of the means of communication and ignoring a subject that stirs up a lot of curiosity, but that constant preoccupation with the management of their communication by the parents appeared to us, to say the least, astonishing. They were more concerned with how they appeared in the press than finding their child is the worry here. Telephone calls on the night of the disappearance, the tracking of Portuguese and foreign paedophiles, the majority English, residing in the region or simply on holiday, continues to be checked. In spite of the kilometres covered, the interviews and searches carried out, there's nothing concrete that leads us to suspect any of them. The investigations deal with the information collected, the statements from those at the club, the Ocean Club, and the, the lists of telephone calls that are made available to them. We must also check communication via mobile phones. It's possible the abductor used a mobile. We, re we locate the relay antenna of various operators covering the sector in order to obtain the summary of calls and messages. Finally, the only suspicious communications are those involving Robert Murat, a person who's central to this case will later be placed under investigation. Interestingly, later on when this Christian, whatever his name was, brought up, it was all mobile phone. Oh, he's connected to a tower mobile phone. This paedophile was in the area from Germany. Well, they were checking the phone things and the paedophiles and they didn't find that on the t at the time. Uh, Clement Freud, you can mention whatever you want in chat. I'm not going to cover it. I'm going to cover this book. Um, but, you know, I know what you're talking about. Yeah. Um, it is fucking weird, isn't it, that they visited a known paedophile following the death of their daughter. I mean, the disappearance of their daughter. Yeah. The walls of the crisis unit are little by little covered in analytical charts, time series charts, sketches, plans, task lists, you know, like you'd expect. The photo of Madeline to always remind us of the objective of our mission. Log of calls on Jerry's phone deleted. Between 11 and 3 in the morning, all members of the investigation meet in the crisis unit. Some don't agree with the, produce, the police judiciaire's press release and think the information should not have been disclosed. Even by way of official press releases, others think it's possible to interpret the visit by the British ambassador as a form of British government intervention, which may not be impartial. So this is all a bit of an issue, isn't it? It's usual for them to get involved with cases of this kind, or is it specific to this case and why? Until now, results have hardly been conclusive. Why not monitor and tap the phones of the parents and friends? The statements are far from, far from convincing. The story about how the window is the story about the window is unsound, and Jane's witness statement is not convincing either. In that way, new details could be obtained. Just one second. We've already discussed it. That would be ideal, only we have to get the judge to give us our authorization, and with the scant details we have at our disposal. So if the parents get wind of it, we risk having the sky fall on our heads. So initially, they want to start checking the parents' phone and tapping their phones, but they're not doing it. In a kidnapping case with a ransom demand, that procedure would be normal, at least for monitoring the parents' phone, monitoring the parents phone calls. That's for certain, but in our case, this comes back to practically accusing them. Further, we don't even know if there's been a crime. I'm well aware, but I insist this would allow them to be ruled out. So he wants to tap their phones 
to rule them out or to rule them in. The questions raised are relevant. Telephone taps would allow unfounded suspicions to be destroyed. So on May the 4th, the parents authorise us to check the phone logs on their mobile. So on May the 4th, they authorise it. Here's a summary of the calls. I only have that of the couple. We've yet to receive the summary from BTS, British Telecom Services or whatever. Okay, what have we got? What do you see? Between April 27th and May the 4th, Kate did not make any calls. None either between 11.22 and 11.17 on the night of the disappearance. Kate mustn't like making telephone calls. For Jerry, there's nothing before May the 4th at exactly 12.15. What does that mean? They never made phone calls. There's something here. Look at the number on top of the list. On her telephone, her husband's number is logged. She called him on May the 3rd at 11.17. But on Jerry's phone, there's nothing. No trace of that call. How can that be explained? It's simple as anything. The list of calls has been deleted. The list of calls has been deleted. On the night of May the 3rd, and before the, the morning of May the 4th, 12.15 a.m., so the, it's basically the same night, isn't it? The night of May the 3rd. Kate calls Jerry, and Jerry, or somebody, deletes the call log. How can that be explained? And why? Now, what's really strange, isn't it? What's really strange, and I need to get another window for this, actually. Let's copy and paste that in. And go. What's really strange is that on the evening of May the 3rd, she goes missing. So we're talking about the night she goes missing, yeah? And they have chosen to delete, or Jerry's chosen, it seems, you know, again, you've got to be careful what I would say in a way, but it seems that he's decided to delete his call logs on the night she goes missing. But we can see that he was called. So we know that he was called, but there's no trace of that on his phone. I don't know what kind of frame of mind you'd be in. But I don't know if my child was missing that I'd feel compelled to do anything on my mobile phone other than call people. I don't think I'd have the time to fiddle with it and delete call logs and look. I, just, I don't know why I would do that. It could be a mistake. It could go off in your pocket. It could happen in your pocket. You know, you sat on the phone. I don't know. But at the moment, that's stirring up a worry in the mind of the police. They sum up, and this is the the police detective who's in charge of the investigation. The first phone calls were exchanged one hour after the disappearance. It could be imagined that in that lapse of time, they were busy looking for their daughter. Nevertheless, it's astonishing that they didn't need to speak to each other at such a difficult time. So in the first hour, we've got an hour where they think they might be busy looking for her before they call the police and before they do this and that, that or even call each other while they're out looking. But, we now reflect, don't we? It's possible that in that hour something else could have been happening. Later I learned the English Secret Service has already placed the couple under telephone surveillance. If that's true, the police Portuguese police were never informed. Again, it's just a back and forth between the two, isn't it? The Polish trail leads to an impasse. Again, I don't want to go over these things that lead to nothing, but it's all here in the book. They are searching down these leads. It comes to nothing. And it's another example of these lots and lots of... Um, and this Rich Hall's a bit uh, guilty of this. Lots of lots of different ideas are thrown up and it causes the police problems because they have to go and look at them all. You as an investigative person looking through 24 hours of Madeleine McCann content, you know, you're going to get thrown... Bugger off, you chuffing fly. Now I've got a fly in the room and the window closed. We're going to be in issues with that. I have to open the window again, you chuffer. Oh, I just have to deal with it. I just have to live with a fly in the room, don't I? So anyway, it's... It's an issue to them, isn't it? That they get all these leads thrown up and they're trying to do their job. And it could also be, it could be looked at as muddying the water. We don't know where these sightings come from. We've got no verification of it, certainly not in his book. It could be someone in Poland who's very conscientious, has seen someone who looks like Madeline and called it up. Or it could be something else, we don't know. But we do know that all of these different uh, sightings start to muddy the water. And that even if one of them is correct, 
99% of them can't be correct if one of them is. You know, the one that's correct is correct, the others aren't. And during this time, all this media hype, it causes a lot of problems for the police. They have to have a bigger control room. They're getting calls from all over the world. That's an issue. And when it comes up in this book, I'm going to skim over it because I don't want to read things that aren't relating to it. But um, it is important, isn't it? So we're already setting the scene here, aren't we? That's chapter three, the announcement of the disappearance. We've got 20 chapters or more. And we've done an hour and a half. So we're not going to get it all done in one episode, but that's fine. I said it would be this week we'd do this. Let's move on to chapter four. And what I would like to do is, as you've, you know, you've got a few of you here in chat now, um, when we, uh, when we, get towards the end of the episode I'll consider we might not want to play words on stream because it might be a bit um, I do accept someone said to me yesterday was it you Rudy that I was being a bit um, blase about Madeline and her death and it, you know she's a child who died so I should be a bit more compassionate and uh, so therefore I don't know if we want to play a word game at the end but I'll certainly donate some money to UNICEF the United Nations Children's Fund uh, you know not just from on behalf of us on stream for my, you know, I'll donate. We we like to do that on Wednesdays, and I'll I'll just do it at the end of the episode if we don't play the game. But um, yeah, so a criminal investigation, knowledge of the victim is essential. A physical description is not enough. Her personality, her habits, other interests, you know, it's important to know all about her, isn't it? The victim's a child. The information becomes more piecemate, piecemeal, and it's difficult to define a still evolving personality. According to stats in Great Britain, parents and close relatives are involved in the majority of cases of missing children. According to, st according to st statistics, including Great Britain, parents and close relatives are involved in the majority of cases of missing children. Certainly that's not proof. A common sense rule, however, says doubt their word without this meaning that they're to be considered as suspects. So at this point, they're not suspects, but we don't take everything they say for granted because in the majority of cases, they're involved. The information they provide must be cross-checked. The public in general are deeply, dis are deeply touched by the misfortune that's befallen the family. They can all imagine the anxiety and pain. The investigator, however, cannot lose sight of the objectives. They have to devote their efforts to the discovery of the truth. In disappearance cases, the first hypothesis is that of a voluntary departure. An appeal for witnesses accompanied by a detailed description is then issued. Police forces, sniffer dogs, in parallel, the investigation must not rule out the possibility of a crime. The three basic questions which must be answered are as follows. What happened, where and why? Every place likely to be the crime scene is gone over with a fine tooth comb. Searches and inspections are undertaken to gather evidence. This is all from the book that Madeline McCann's, pan, Madeline McCann's parents tried to ban. It's midnight when I received the news about the disappearance of the four-year-old girl. At the time of her disappearance, the little girl was supposed to have been sleeping in an apartment while her parents were dining a hundred meters away. An it's inspector. Again. Oh, I couldn't tippies. Be tippies, I getting some worry. tippies. I will. I'm not going to make a big wave of the hands because, again, trying to be respectful to Madeline McCann more than I was yesterday because I will accept that. So I won't wave my hands and go, yay, I'm getting money. But yay, I'm getting money. Look, um, someone bought me a coffee for all the children. Nice. Thank you. Oh, thank you. That I'll, I'll put that straight in. We'll double up what we give to UNICEF at the end of episode. I'll put that straight into UNICEF. Thank you. Um, and I really appreciate you. I, I, I'm trying to earn a living off this stream. But uh, certainly I don't really feel like earning a living off Madeleine McCann's death. You know, I'm not monetized. So there's not that ethical worry. But um, if you donate and tippy to me today, I think, unless it's something ridiculous like £200, and I'd think, well, I'd better have £20 of that and give the rest to UNICEF. Um, I, I will be giving the money to UNICEF. I hope you accept all that on your behalf is a good thing. Um, and I'll be putting in my own contribution on top of what we get tippied, so thank you. Um, you'll see it on stream at the end of the episode anyway. It's midnight when I receive the, the news, so... A forensic expert assigned to the security of the premises will join the police. All precautions are taken to preserve possible clues and elements of evidence. We've been through this a little bit before uh, in the reading of this book. Uh, the head of the guards already alerted the police at the airport and the control post was set up. The reports leave a lot to be desired. The examination of the premises and... Sorry, the examination of the premises by the investigator and the representative of the forensic police just after the announcement of the disappearance turns out to be unproductive. A concise report where their observations are written up 
It's accompanied by numerous photographs taken inside and outside the apartment, which don't give an account, according to us, of everything they could have observed. The error is explained by the absence of procedures in the case of a child's disappearance. So they don't have like a list of procedures, but they, the head of the investigation is a bit un, unimpressed, thinks they could have done a bit more. Lots of people were already in place. No one appeared in the photos. We don't know how they were dressed. Such, ob such observations can, import, can be important later on. Have I already read this bit? Or did I read it yesterday? Maybe I'm tripping. Um, you've got to take care of something. Don't worry, Rudy. It'll be all recorded on the internet and you'll be able to watch it later. No problem. Um, on the contrary, the photographs, you can see empty cots. I think I read this earlier, didn't I? Am I tripping? Day f Chapter 5. The days that followed. Let me just check that I was... Confirm this. Something isn't right. She alleged... I just taken an investigation. All witnesses, all the tourists. Yeah, this is what we just read, isn't it? I'm just tripping. Sorry. Yeah, we've read this bit. Okay, so that can go. Chapter five now then. Uh, we're an hour and 40 in. We can run about two and a half hours, maybe three. So uh, I will continue. Chapter five, the days that followed. The arrival of the English police. On May the 7th, Monday, we start to welcome our English colleagues from Leicestershire, the county where Madeline and her parents live. Where we, when we requested the collaboration of the English police, our request was passed on via the liaison officer of soccer. This is what you were talking about in chat. We thought the case of abduction was within the jurisdiction of Scotland Yard. Oh, S Scotland Yard. Is that soccer? I don't know. Um, they were much more experienced than others in the fight against violent crime. I'm just going to find out what soccer is, is it? Scotland Yard. Paste and go. Serious organised crime agency. Right, got it. Got it. We thought the case of abduction was much more within the jurisdiction of Scotland Yard. We were much more experienced than others in the fight against violent crime. We learned in Great Britain investigations are consigned to the sector where the victim resides. Nevertheless, Scotland, will Scotland Yard will intervene later on. Serious organised crime agency. The first leads. In the Zavial area, a few kilometres from Villa de Luz, there's a 46-year-old British citizen who's suspected of paedophilia by his neighbours. Again, like I told you, I was going to skim over some of these leads because they dig into them, they go nowhere. Uh, the white van seen near the club, driven by an individual who looked like a tramp, ends up being identified. It belongs to a music teacher, age 56. He's spending his holiday playing the guitar and collecting money on the beach. Jerry passed on the prominent... It's certainly him that Jerry passed on the promenade on the day he bought an ice cream for Madeline. It's also he who was seen near the apartment in the vehicle he uses as, as a living space. The follow-up inv investigation totally rules him out. So, again, you know, I'm, I said I wouldn't read that, but I did. I read that one because there was this idea that this white van man, uh, this Christian Brookheimer might be this white van man, and no, they've ruled it out. Ocean Club blocks four and five. In the hope of retracing the path Madeline would have taken on the night of May the 3rd, we set up an operation bringing sniffer dogs in from Lisbon, from the National Republican Guard. An identical operation has already taken place on the same night as the disappearance with dogs from local police. The idea is to start from apartment 5A and follow all the roads that lead to the accommodation blocks. From the start, we were aware of the limits of this approach. The GNR dogs are trained for searching in a rural environment. In addition, the persistence of bodily odours diminishes after 48 hours. We get them to sniff a towel, to which, according to Kate, was used to dry Madeline after her bath. So, according to Kate, this towel. So, is the towel definitely got Madeline sent on? Well, according to Kate, it has. We have to go through Kate for that. When the dogs finish going along block 5, they logically should have been heading to block 4, they suddenly turn to the left. They then follow the path at the back, which separates the apartments from the leisure area. They go quite a long way in that direction. Even if the reaction of the two dogs coincides, the trainers cannot draw any definite conclusions. In fact, it's already been two days since the disappearance. What they can state with certainty is that Madeline went along there without being able to pinpoint the date. Gerald McCann follows this claim, confirms this claim. He took that same route with Madeline a few days earlier. So 
I don't know exactly what route we're talking about here. On the map, we're saying along block five, they should have been heading for block four. They turn to the left and follow the path at the back, which separates the apartments from the leisure area. So I think we're looking at this path here. This one here, Ocean Club. Could be this. Don't think it is. That seems to be the back to me. But I think that's the front when you look at the building and that this is all the back. You know, like if you come to a hotel and you see the big fascia at the front of the hotel, I think that's this. And that the apartment's back onto the pool, like you would have your back garden, wouldn't you, in your pool in your back garden like that. So this is actually the back. So they're talking about this path here, I think. Now, is it possible that an abductor went this way with Madeline? Is it possible an abductor removed her from the room, side window, and then came through the Ocean Club, where they'd recently abducted the child, past all of the apartments? If Jerry's familiar with this road, because he said he's been going there down this way towards the beach, getting ice creams and what have you, if Jerry's familiar with this path, maybe he would be more likely to take that path, with Madeline or without her. Or in any situation. You know, it's just, just a, a thing to think about, isn't it? The sniffer dogs indicated she'd been down this path, which she had. But that's all we can find out from that. The cadaver dogs nailed it. Oh, yes, absolutely. We looked at them briefly yesterday. When it comes to the point, we will look at them again in our episode. And if not, if it doesn't come up here now in today's episode, I will uh, bring it up and talk about it at the very end quickly and show the cadaver dogs because they're very interesting, aren't they? Um, I'm just going to have to quickly take a bathroom break. So I'll leave you with the image of the uh, the place and a little bit of relaxing music, but just, you know, nature calls. So just one sec. Oosh. Here we go. Even if the reaction of the two dogs coincides, the trainers cannot draw definite conclusions. Then we get this, and this starts to actually annoy me. I must reflect as well that what we're doing, a wee break here, a little break. Um, what we're doing now is we're talking about a book that was written by the police officer in charge of the investigation. Madeleine McCann's parents tried to get it banned, tried to have him sued for defamation, uh, libel, slander, failed in that the European court has ruled it's okay. So we're looking at the book that the detective who led the investigation wrote. I'm stopping occasionally to talk our reflections, our ideas, so it's fair use. This is coming under fair use. And on top of that, uh, it's translation. So I think this totally comes into fair use. We're not reading every part of it. We're missing some chunks that are a bit more colour or talking about failed lines of investigation. We're going for the main thing. And through our probably two or three episodes of this, because there's quite a few chapters, we're doing about five or six an episode. Uh, and there's about 20, so we'll probably do two or three episodes, maybe even four. So through this week, we should get to the, the end of the book. And then we've also got the Madeleine McCann... Uh, parents interviews the hidden embedded confessions the rich hall videos and the cadaver dogs videos to look at so there's a, a bit of content to be drawn out here 
Madliani spotted all over the world. This annoys me. I remember it happening. I'm sure you do too. It was huge, wasn't it? It was on the news. She was everywhere. She was seen under everyone's bed. And, you know, unlike Shannon Matthews, who was actually under the bed, she was seen all over the world. It was a huge media thing. It was in all the papers. All the papers was, you know, find Maddie, weren't they? Huge media thing. Sold a lot of papers, didn't it? Big things like... Uh, we had this news of the world find Maddie Beach. Now, we talk about distasteful, right? We talk about distasteful. Okay. Yesterday, I was making some jokes, wasn't I? Oh, she's dead in the sea. You know, I was saying it as a matter of fact. I wasn't making jokes, actually. Let's be fair to me. <laughs> I wasn't making jokes. She was. I was saying, as a matter of fact, well, she's rotting in the sea. And it was a pretty horrible thing to say about a little girl. But I was saying what I considered to be facts, sort of dispassionately. And when critiqued in chat about it, I will accept that I was wrong to do that. I should be more compassionate. I find this disgusting, though, right? Because when she was missing... All this Find Maddie stuff went out. News of the World did a huge campaign, didn't they? Now, this might ostensibly be a great big inflatable billboard on the beach to help find a little girl. That might be what it is. If that's the case, I don't know if you need your News of the World logo on it, predominantly in first. Because what this also is, is a front page of a newspaper on a great big billboard on a beach. This is marketing for the News of the World. It makes them look good because they're trying to find this this girl. The 1.5 million reward may never be paid out if you don't find her, if you know you're not going to. It makes your paper look to be ethical and it's promoting it on the beaches in a place that you wouldn't normally be allowed to advertise. You've, you've tied in your commercial enterprise, your media group, your media product. You've tied that in with Madeleine McCann's disappearance, a bit like what we're doing today, but you've tied it in in a very sneaky and horrible way. And these things would not necessarily have been paid for. I don't know who paid for that, but you know, if we're using the fighting fund to pay for this sort of stuff, then we're also using the fighting fund to promote the news of the world. Bottom line, aren't we? That That's marketing. It might be helping find Madeleine, yes, but it's marketing, news of the world. So immediately... What was seen to be by the average person on the street as a Find Maddie campaign, to people like me, with my brain, you know, to people like me, I was looking at this as, well, this is a bit crass, isn't it? Because they use, they're hijacking the Find Maddie campaign to, to, to promote their newspaper. Usually these things are run by the police or Interpol, aren't they? And actually, oh yeah, News of the World, good point, uncontrolled story, and they were proven to be doing phone tapping, weren't they? So I don't know what they know behind the scenes, this and that. What I do know is that I found that to be disgusting, even though a lot of people thought it was really good, socially, morally, ethically good. It turned out that News of the World were not socially, morally, ethically good. We found that out later. But during this, they used it, didn't they? They used Madeleine McCann and her image to promote their newspaper all over the world. So that was going on. And what that led to was spottings all over the world. Now, she's not all over the world. I've said this a number of times during this broadcast. It just clouded. It just clouded the investigation. And almost simultaneously, she's in Zurich and on the corner of Rio de Janeiro, de Janeiro Street. Faced with this tidal wave, rules have to be established. It's impossible for us to check everything. The local police have to check the, the witness statements, the local police, where they're coming from, and take all the measures and the DNA. And then there's the Moroccan saga. A Norwegian woman who lives in the south of Spain recognised Madeleine in a service station in Marrakesh. From then on, the greatest number of witness statements come to us from Morocco. Bizarrely, each time someone states they saw Madeleine, she's always in pyjamas and bare feet, which you would think days later she may not still be but leaping forward in time and in the chronology a few days after their return to great britain repeated statements from the clan mccann who are not budging from the moroccan trail will we ever know why encourage a young spanish woman to more closely examine photos she took in morocco uh, he's not seen the photo he responds unfortunately it's got to be a mistake we asked the chief of Leicester Police where he is up to it. He explains that having seen the photo, he immediately submitted it to McCann's, asked them if they recognised their daughter, to which they replied with a perhaps. A perhaps. It was this thing, the gypsies had this blonde-haired child and people thought that was Madeleine. 
turned out not to be. Turned out not to be. The end, on, and now we get to Saturday, May the 12th. So I don't want to jump out in chronology, but they've moved on a bit here, haven't they? But The individual seen in the gardens at the Ocean Club, not far from the apartment, is identified. A 53-year-old British gardener who's worked a few times for Robert Murat's family's gardening company. The search is carried out in his home and car provide nothing. Further, his presence on the premises was justified and there's nothing linking him to Madeline. We learn by chance that McCann's beginning to use their connections and that on May 23rd they allegedly made contact with the future British Prime Minister Gordon Brown. We're convinced the investigation is going to suffer all sorts of pressure and that Madeleine's disappearance will be treated as a political problem in Great Britain. And that was weird to me. I remember at the time, just tangent now, just a little tangent. Uh, I remember at the time it was they visited the Pope, didn't they, at one point? The McCanns, they met with the Pope They've been talking to the Prime Minister. What the fuck is the Prime Minister, or at this, at this point, the Chancellor of the Exchequer, Deputy Prime Minister Gordon Brown, what the fuck has the Chancellor of the Exchequer got to do with the disappearance of your daughter and helping find her? I don't know. But they talked to some pretty high up and weird people during that time, didn't they? Under the guise of, we desperately want to find our daughter and we will do anything to find her, and that means roping in the Pope and roping in the British government. But... But a normal human being would think that you'd be there on the ground looking around, you know, not bothered about talking to the Prime Minister, more bothered about looking for your daughter, like, you know, hunting for her. But they displayed this really strange behaviour as far as I was concerned. In spite of our having hundreds of pieces of information in our possession, we begin to realise there's still some missing. At this time, everybody's aware of the theory of abduction. Residents and tourists on the night of the 3rd have heard about this stranger who was allegedly seen going around the streets with a child in his arms. It wasn't ruled out the man could be local, quietly going home carrying his sleeping child. On May 25th, then, we launched an appeal in the media. Has anyone seen an individual corresponding to the description? No one responded. So that's interesting, isn't it? Jane Tanner gave a description of a man seen carrying a child in his arms. Everyone in the area is now aware of what's going down. The police directly respond to them. Has anyone seen this man? Even innocently taking his child... Are you, did you carry your child home that night? Is anyone aware? No. Nobody at all. When Robert Murat is placed under investigation, we review the press photos taken just after Madeline's disappearance. We want to check out what he was wearing and with whom he was in contact. On the morning of May the 4th, Murat is seen near some GNR members in the company of two individuals of English nationality. As we find out later, one of them is of Asian origin. Ocean Club tourists, probably. We also examine photos taken by the McCanns during their holiday. In one of them, Gerald's seen playing with his children in the Tapas restaurant play area. Tapas. In the background, you can make out a, an Asian-looking man. He's the same one seen in Robert Murat's company. He seems to be observing the family. We then proceed to identify him and the other holidaymakers that Murat has been in contact with. We get this information to the English police who interviewed them locally. They conclude they weren't involved in the disappearance. In fact, the man in the photo was with his daughter and there was nothing suspicious about his behaviour. So what this does prove, again, is that lots of leads, lots of ideas, the police are digging deep and people are being ruled out. A few days later, these photos are published in an English newspaper. It's not known how they were obtained or for what purpose they were disclosed. Seems weird, doesn't it? That a few days after they rule somebody out, the media create a big storm about could this, you know, what are they publishing these photos for? Making people think this Asian man might have done it. They just ruled him out. They spoke to the English police and made contact to make sure they could rule them out. And then somehow the press get these photos. So that's a bit fishy, isn't it? One of the Ocean Club tourists states that he heard Jerry on the phone saying there were paedophile networks in Portugal and that it was them who were responsible for Madeline's abduction. Absolutely astonishing. Just a few hours after his daughter's disappearance, he knows who's guilty. Now, it might be conjecture. He might have been jumping to bad conclusions. He might have been getting wound up and excited. But it is astonishing, isn't it, that whilst the police are covering their investigation... Jerry's out there on the phone telling people stuff that he thinks is like, bang, fat paedophile groups in Portugal did it. Weird, isn't it? I mean, it is weird. The policeman in charge of the investigation seems to think it's weird. 
Um, yeah, I don't know about their connections, and they certainly made so many more of them since this thing went on. I think the main connection, though, that is that they made is with the lawyer and the right-wing media manager. Because very early on, those people ensured that the fighting fund got filled and that that fighting fund went to the news of the world sometimes, to their lawyers sometimes, to their detectives sometimes. Detectives who were responsible for bringing up all these clues from around the world. Detectives who were responsible for clouding the investigation with leads all over the world. And that money ended up in their pocket, paying for their houses, paying for their food, became their living expenses budget because they put themselves on the board of the directors controlling the fighting fund so when it's a huge amount of money when it's a huge amount of money generated by a right-wing media manager and lawyer people put in with the McCann's media people again I keep saying this is conjecture but I have to dig it out somewhere when I think Richard D Hall covered it um you know it, it smacks of something else doesn't it it's it smells fishy in mid-May, we'd already submitted the nine friends of the McCanns to a second round of interviews. In spite of its importance, too upset, seemingly, to countenance the exercise, Kate Healy's was left until later. So Kate wouldn't do an interview. She told them she was too upset. In a view of a number of inconsistencies raised by cross-checking the statements, we're thinking of going ahead with a reconstruction. This is a routine procedure. Above all, when contradictory details pile up, most of the time it helps to make rapid headway with the investigation by placing the various players in the drama, in this case the group of friends, employees of the restaurant, play leaders and other witnesses, into a situation identical to what's experienced. Differences between the versions become obvious. So they want them to go and sit there again and say, right, you were sat there, it's coming up to 11 o'clock, what did you do? Did you see them doing that? Do you remember this? You know, they want them to go over it again. The reconstruction never took place. The reasons put forward to justify the decision, in spite of opinions to the contrary, are multiple. There are lots of holidaymakers sealing off the perimeter would ruin their stay. The airspace would have to be closed. The hotel complex would be overrun with hordes of journalists. People might think the parents and their friends were suspects. And of course, the field mustn't be left open for that kind of deliberation. Which is weird, isn't it? Because initially he said you should think about that. So he's saying that people are saying that they don't want that to happen. For all that, a more discreet reconstruction, even partial, with only the couple present, might provide useful information. No prior judgment is implied. Quite the contrary, it's quite simply the cooperation that we have the right to expect on the part of the parents faced with such a situation. I'm convinced there's still a need for reconstruction, whatever form it takes. The staging of the events on May the 3rd from the details gathered from the witnesses would help to revive memories. It's difficult to understand why that's not possible. And when he says why it's not possible, he's not giving us uh, a clear reason, is he? He's not saying that this person said they wouldn't do it or this person from the hotel said we couldn't do it. But you'd think that the hotel have been cooperative with most of this and would be cooperative with the police, wouldn't you? You would expect the hotel would say, OK, look, it's bad for the guests. We've still got holidaymakers here, but fucking get on with it then quick because all these press are here and everything. And we want to find out what's going on. Like you'd think that would be the case, wouldn't you? I don't know, but somebody has put a stopper on that and said, we're not doing the reconstruction. The police want to do it. The people involved in the hotel or the people involved in the reconstruction, the actual parents and their friends, they're, between them, somebody's decided not to do this. Again, a big waving red flag, isn't it? You know, you'd think if Madeline was missing and Kate wanted to find her, Jerry wanted to find her and the police said we want to do a reconstruction they'd say fucking let's go when do we start get me down there who's saying we won't do it the, 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 the hotel is saying we won't do it right we're going to fucking have a word with them we want to do our reconstruction I don't care about your holiday makers and your guests our daughter's missing you know it seems weird doesn't it big red flag an attempted extortion and an unconcerned father on June the 14th so we're jumping around in time May June this is a month later the parents are contacted by a stranger who states he's in possession of information about Madeline's whereabouts. Following the advice of the investigators, the McCanns set up an email address in order to maintain contact more easily and to better evaluate the reliability of the source. So strange, isn't it, that they've got investigators giving them advice 
I don't know if that's their own investigators or the police investigators, but the McCanns are setting up the email address and doing the contact. In the course of the exchanges, the stranger demands 2 million euros, of which an advance of half a million euros must be sent to a person of his acquaintance in the Netherlands. A rogatory letter is obtained. Don't know what that means. I have to find out. New word every day. Seeking information, authorised to examine witnesses or ascertain facts. It's a legal term, rogatory letter. I might be pronouncing it wrong. Rogatory. The Dutch courts and police are asked for assistance in locating and identifying the individual. The McCanns are anxious and impatient. They think the emails sent are credible and they respond very quickly. They lived in the Netherlands with Madeline before the birth of their twins. Would somebody who knew them there have kidnapped their little girl to obtain a ransom? Kate and Gerald are convinced they're going to succeed, thanks to this lead in finding Madeline. But that conviction will not last long, as we find out later. It's interesting, isn't it? One that, that little... Someone sent a funny email. We've got information, give me two million euros. You might think, oh, hang on, wait, wait, you know, wait. Um, hello, uh, you want two million euros for information? Maybe you're bullshitting, Hello. You know, maybe instead of implying yourself as guilty, you know, putting yourself forward, oh, I know what happened, therefore I'm involved in the crime and, you know, have friends who are involved in the crime, so I'm guilty. You put yourself forward as guilty or Im implicated in the crime because you want the money. Uh, it seems a bit dangerous to do it. And also, like, if you were guilty, would you really come forward? Maybe you just want the money. Like, there's all sorts of issues there, aren't there? But the McCanns, he says, the lead investigator of the police investigation, says that, they're convinced they're going to succeed. Informed of the emails, the Portuguese police, in agreement with the English and Dutch, engage in negotiations by email with the informant. The police ask Gerald McCann or advise him on how to act in order to obtain information. If the lead turned out to be credible, Madeline might be freed and her abductors captured. One day, we're all together at the PJ in Port Mau. I think that's the police you know, office. Inspectors and negotiations, negotiators, members of Scotland Yard and the Leicestershire Police waiting for a contact to define the place and the conditions for the handing over of the money in Holland. So they're going through with this thing, with the big money handover. When the tension was at its height and we're all holding our breath, Gerald McCann displayed a nonchalance that surprised all of the police officers present, including the English. The atmosphere got heavier as the waiting drew out, but McCann relaxed, was reading trivia on the internet and discussing rugby and football with the English police while licking a lollipop. On the telephone, he laughed with friends who called him. Perhaps this was nervousness. Sometimes it's totally displaced given what's at stake at the time. His attitude shocked. When, two days later, the Dutch police informed us that the individual had been arrested, that he was not holding any information and had lied from the start to the finish with the sole objective of extorting money from the couple, we were not surprised. Did Jerry know this lead would take us to a dead end? Is that the reason he appeared to be so nonchalant? Or was it due to the coldness that he never lost throughout the investigation? An attitude that made one of the English police officers say, don't forget... He's a heart surgeon and he cuts people open before breakfast. Remember going back to what I said that Madeleine and McCann's parents, you know, being a surgeon, being a doctor, can, he can put himself in this cold and dispassionate place and say, look, you know, my feelings and all that. The coldness, you know, it comes through. I would suggest something else. And I'm only, again, conjecture, you know, doing a bit of uh, reaction, doing a bit of thinking. So it's not chopping libel or slander and it is fair use because I'm now making comment I would also say that if Jerry was in some way involved in obtaining the money you know if this was a scam to scam some money because you know half a million 200 2 million euros is quite a lot you might not get the 2 million you might get the half a million paid out as a you know that was the, the idea, wasn't it? We give you half a million first, then you come up with the information, we give you the two million. Maybe, you know, he's there sucking a lollipop and laughing because he's about to come into half a million quid. Do you know what I mean? Maybe someone who's, I don't know if he's got other debts. I don't know what's going on in their life, but suddenly half a million quid's on the table. If you thought that you were in a room and the process of what you were doing in that room was about to get you half a million quid, it might cheer you up. So 
So we're at, so now we've got the guy who's running the investigation has said that he's always been strange. He's always behaved strange, Jerry. He's always been cold and different. Different to how he would expect someone like Jerry in his situation to behave. If we can do up to chapter six, three sixes or 18, I think we get it done in three episodes. So let's hammer out chapter six. The arrival of the English police. After Madeline's appearance, the English police officers came May 5th, Glen Power, liaison officer to Portugal. It's a number of pivots on which international police collaboration lies. They facilitate communication between the two. He's known Glen Power for a long time. So they have this team put into... Personalities are important. The information committed to memory, knowledge of details, cross-checks allow us to be responsive to the slightest indications. The makeup of the team remains the same from the start to the finish of the investigation. The English colleagues arrive. The National Director of the Police Jurisdiction in Portugal, Portuguese, whatever, uh, authorise the arrival. They insist on knowing the English, what the English counterparts have come to Portugal to do. They assign one of their investigators to follow the English superintendent like a shadow so that it can be kept informed of his actions. They want to be informed of everything he learns, the names of the people he meets and the places he goes to. The two police officers arrive. They're assigned to psychological support and communication with the family. Two police officers arrive, assigned to psychologically support and communicate with the family. Little by little, the number of police officers grows exponentially. We place at their disposal a room next to ours. There are specialists from all different services. The analysts trace timelines and patterns of connections based on witnesses. They produce giant summary boards. On May the 14th, Kate's indignant about the attitude of, of her the eight. Uh, <coughs> excuse me. On May the 14th, Kate Healy is indignant about the attitude of the liaison officer who asks where her daughter is. Neither she nor her husband accepts anyone doubting their word. The officer will be sent packing and his colleague too. A week after this arrival, that attitude is, to say the least, shocking on the part of the parents confronted by such a situation. That, what is more, is in a foreign country. Those two police officers who distinguished themselves through a long experience in the management of situations of kidnap and abduction were, all the same, entirely at their disposal. They provided daily logis logistical and legal support. They afforded them all the help they could have needed. Curiously, the English did not consider it expedient to disclose the incident, and we're not informed. Myself, I only learn of it indirectly. Finally, a solution is found quickly. The two men are replaced by a Portuguese man who speaks fluent English. During this time, the police continued to receive a number of considerable inquiries that they have trouble sorting and analysing. It's this thing again, isn't it? The McCanns are given a real resource. Two policemen, one to liaise, one to help them. The police them, that are put with them start asking them questions that are difficult. They fuck them off. And then the police start to get this large number of inquiries. Of course, there's this campaign going in the news, news of the world led by the McCanns media advisor. So there's going to be a lot of reports, but it seems strange that they would not have the experienced police at their side in the week after the missing daughter. You'd think you'd want them, wouldn't you? You'd think you'd want to answer every question they had. Ask me everything. Like, you're an expert on this. Ask me everything. I'll fill you in on every piece of data. Ask me again. I'm not offended. No, I don't care. Uh, my emotions can be put aside. I'm a doctor, for Christ's sake. This is about finding my daughter. Ask me anything. But no, but no, they bin them off. They've gone, put aside. On May the 15th, Inspector Ricardo Paiva is sent as a reinforcement to the English who welcome him warmly and feed him on tea and cakes. Most of the information received from all over the world are of no interest, so there's no reason to follow up. People allegedly recognise Madeline and claim to see her clairvoyance with confused messages. You know, all this bullshit. So... They don't, the Portuguese press already are saying this isn't helping. This isn't helping. And they're convinced, they're not convinced of the pertinence of the method that consists of requesting help from the population to resolve a case. They don't think that you can solve the crime by asking people to phone you up and solve the crime for you. The police in Portugal think they solve the crime by collecting evidence <laughs> and having a more police based approach. Whereas letting everyone in the world call them up and flood their hotline with bullshit doesn't seem to help. 
But of course, the news of the world make a big thing of it, don't they? So, uh, at the same time as the Portuguese police are telling them this is not helping, they're doing even more of this. Weird. On Tuesday, June the 12th, so we're jumping around in time again, this is a month later, Bob Small and Chris Eyre head off to the Leicestershire Area Police. They go to Faro meetings and the police force sets out the requirements. Everything goes well and they're aware of an incident between Kate and the liaison officers, but it's not brought up. We have an impression that politically correct hypothesis of abduction is still favoured, but that other possibilities are not being ruled out. Now remember, the very first thing that the police officer said that you should consider is the parents, the relatives, because they're the people that, in most cases, are actually at fault, are actually connected, in most cases. And most police would go straight there and start asking those questions. So we would think that's what the liaison officers were doing and that's why they've been kicked out. And we would think that it would still be being done by the other police officers, but it's not. The politically correct hypothesis of abduction, the one that sells the papers, the one that's drawing in the money, that's the one that they're, they're going to stick by. As time went by, we noticed a certain number of the police officers sent to Portugal were poorly informed about the progress of the investigation. One of them, like the majority, was coming to Portugal for the first time, wearing a green and yellow rubber wristband bought for £2, which he played with nervously. The inscription read, Look for Madeline. Some of his colleagues told him that he would soon get rid of it. As a matter of fact, he took it off as soon as he got properly into the investigation and he learned about the evidence placing doubt on the theory of abduction. So they're saying, the police officers in Portugal are saying that you're sending us people from England, police officers who have no understanding of what's going on. They're coming here preloaded with ideas to the point that they paid money into the fighting fund. <laughs> given money to... Is it correct that a police officer should have given money to one of the people involved in this in the, the case like madeline mccann's parents they're involved in the case maybe not a suspects officially yet but they should be and one of the police officers has paid money into their charitable fund to fund their fighting fund look for madeline and we know later that money became their money as they changed the reason for the fighting fund existing to include paying for their bills and they put themselves on the board of directors of said fighting fund so that seems really fucking weird doesn't it um, interesting stuff in chat, which again, I'm not going to, it's up there, if anyone wants to talk about it in chat, in the comments and everything, it's up there, you know, it's l recorded live on the, the thing, but I'm not going to divert to talk about it, but I will say I'm seeing it and it's interesting, so interesting stuff, um, but I'm going to keep this on topic just so that I don't, don't ever get binned off the internet for it, <laughs> uh, that's chapter 7. We'll go on to chapter 8, and then I think we'll finish with uh, a bit of charity donation, Sorry, that was chapter six. We'll go on to seven and then we'll finish. We'll get up to the man with the child in his arms. This next one's quite big. It's suspicious behavior. So this is quite a big one. Suspicious behavior and contradictions, the Murat case. Now, Robert Murat is featured quite heavily by Richard D. Hall in his work. He does like three episodes on it. Uh, yeah, three episodes on Robert Murat. So if you want to look deeper, I will, you know, I will say that this work is good. I don't, uh, as a critical reporter, as someone who's gone there and just, you know, done research, found out information and then reported it. Good work here by Robert Richard D. Hall on, on YouTube. And we will watch the Embedded Confessions video, hopefully at the end of this week. They're quite big. There's quite a lot to get through. But as I will reiterate, sadly... This comes in a slew of bullshit because David Icke and shape-shifting is probably not the best thing. You know, presenting your news show from space about David Icke and shape-shifting lizards, probably rubbish. You know, David Icke, I contend, lost his marbles. Goalkeeper for Coventry City, injured, no longer able to afford his house, saw his entire world falling out of the, its arse. Sometimes when that happens, you can lose your marbles, you can. You can have, like, mental breakdowns. And it seems that his took the form of this uh, decision to tell the world that he was God, the Godhead, he was God. Another feature of psychosis, quite often you get these delusions of grandeur. 
Um, so David Icke ex expressed some very... I mean, I'm going on a tangent now, aren't I? But I'm just explaining why I think David Icke is not the most uh, reliable of, of sources of information because he appeared to have a mental breakdown. And the result of that mental breakdown was media coverage, which led to him finding another source of income. So, you know, make of that what you will. But... The problem with Richard D. Hall's information is that it's put on a channel that's full of all this other shit. And some of it might not be shit. You have to work it out for yourself. But I'm sure, and when I'm saying I'm sure, I'm pretty sure that, uh, like, this seemingly anti-Semitic content and uh, the idea that we've, you know, 40 years of UFOs and stuff... I, you know, going for UFOs, going for David Icke, going for lizard people, going for all that, and then putting the Madeleine McCann stuff. You should have your own channel for the Madeleine McCann stuff, Rich. Just let it be taken seriously, because it's good work, the Madeleine McCann stuff. That stuff where he's gone out and done actual research. And the other stuff may seem to be research, but it it muddies the water of his own work here, doesn't it? You know, I mean, you have different ideas and never understood the mirror angle. Again, I think myself personally, I will say that I think three videos about this guy, Robert Murat, interesting as they are, are what the McCanns want. Because the McCanns want anything except them to be put in their spotlight, don't they? So they paid loads of money for this big campaign so that anybody except them could have the finger pointed at them. And when something else comes up, and this Robert Murat and someone else, it creates what we've got here, like an hour and a half, three hours of, of content that you have to wade through before you write it off. I know that's the job of the police to investigate every different option. Of course, it's the job of the police to investigate every option. So giving them a million options makes their job harder. But I know that's their job. But for us, what we're doing now is I want to follow the ideas of the lead detective on the case who wrote a book that the, the McCann's tried to ban that's been allowed to be, you know, it's not liable. It's allowed to be out there. I want to follow his story. So he does cover the Murat case here. We'll cover it now. May the 10th, the crisis unit meeting goes on until two in the morning. It's a really sad bit here where he talks about his dog that died and how he buries it and how he thinks and considers what it would be like to bury or to... He says himself that it's easier to disguise the body when he's carrying it around the dead dog than it is to actually dig the hole and bury it. So just some thoughts there. At around eight in the morning, he drives towards Port Matau. I could drive with my eyes closed. This helps me to focus on the latest developments in the investigation. All I notice is the impasse we find ourselves in. We've got the impression we're chasing a ghost. The previous night, we reviewed Jane Tanner's witness statement. The individual she saw parading around in the open street with the child he had just abducted seems less and less credible. And where would he go? If we'd assumed he didn't have a vehicle, he must have hidden in an apartment. They Remember, they searched 400 apartments in the area on those first days. On the route he took, there were several apartment blocks. They were all searched on May the 5th. Nothing was found. A thorough search. More than 500 apartments were visited that day. Only a general examination can be conducted, except where something seems suspicious. The houses in the area have gardens and swimming pools, numerous hiding places that are not easily spotted during a first visit. He continues his journey and reconstructs the individual's path. If he'd planned his crime probably wouldn't have taken this direction. On the other hand, if they hadn't planned it, he has to work it out for himself. So he parks his car in the apartment blocks. Journalists are on the lookout around the apartment. They don't see him. He walks the same route the stranger must have taken, arriving in front of the house with a neglected garden. Inside, there are two parked cars whose registration numbers he notes down. He communicates the numbers to the police and he waits for the results. The driver goes in quickly. The face is familiar to me, but I don't know who it is after this green vehicle driven by an individual stops at the entrance of the house. He notices a child seat in the car. The man comes back out later, supporting an elderly lady who he helps towards one of the areas of the restaurant. They cross a park where a few buildings have been erected. Madeline's parents took this route to take their children to the play center. I'm about to make inquiries of the police officer on duty when the individual comes back and he greets him as he passes. You know that man. Yes, he presented himself to us on Friday morning and offered his services as an, as an interpreter. He's of English origin, but he speaks good Portuguese. He's called Robert Murat. So this guy's offered himself as services. He's an English person, expat. He lives out there and he's offered himself as a helping person. 
As the law demands, all foreign people interviewed by the police must have the benefit of an interpreter. So this is really interesting, isn't it? This is really interesting. I will say a couple of things. That being present in police interviews as an interpreter might be an advantage to those that want information about the interviews, mightn't it? Having someone in the interviews, a friend of theirs. You checked him out, no criminal record. No, it's all okay. I don't know he lived here, but this house is on the route taken by the abductor. Stay here, carry on being friendly with him. I'm going to go and see what we've got on him. I'm going to find out more about the guy. So the lead detective, Goncalo Avril, telephones the team to alert them. We must act with speed because Madeline could be in one of the houses he has access to. The investigators check the information they have about him. So you get the feeling that they're straight on this guy. Or at least the lead detective is. This guy's been floating around a couple of days already. But the lead detective, the minute he's found out about this, he's right, fucking get, let's get on this guy. Let's search all his houses. He's English, age 33, separated from his wife. His wife lives in Britain with their daughter. She's nearly the same age as Madeline and looks like her. The journalist who he gave the information to during an interview was immediately distrusting of him and those reasons that motivated him to help the police. Murat lived with his mother in Villa de Luz for several years. He goes back to England regularly. But from his last stay in Exeter on May the 1st, he has to return there on the 9th. He's ready to postpone his departure, desirous above all else to help the police find Madeline. His behaviour starts to intrigue them. He often makes references to similar cases that happened in the United Kingdom, which he seems to know in detail. Now, they might be a bit confused because they might not have had the same media coverage in the last few years, but I remember I was saying at the time, we had a lot of these um, abduction, paedophile stories in the papers. It was the big news of the time. We have different things at different times. It goes in phases in the news because it sells papers. It's the topic of the hour. It's the folk tales and moral panics that sell the papers. And paedophiles were the big news. So if you were British at that time, you would have known some of these stories because you'd have just seen them in the papers and news. So I think that's less suspicious, but they find it suspicious. He helps us to identify possible suspects. He knows the workings of the club and the habits of the holidaymakers very well. He even allegedly tried to secretly access the secret investigation files. It's also known he visits websites of a pornographic nature. Doesn't everyone. But um, this guy is seeming a bit seedy. He's seeming a bit strange. I would think, personally, that this is actually a um, a good thing, in a way. How do I explain this? If he was whiter than white, perfectly holier than thou, never touched a, a drop of alcohol, never smoked a cigarette, never done anything naughty, didn't even look at pornography, you'd think, hang on, is this right? Or is he pulling the wool over our eyes? The fact that he has a bit of, you know, something slightly dodgy about him, the fact that he does have some kind of, uh, you know, human qualities, makes me think, well, maybe he's less likely to be some cover-up merchant because he's telling them everything. He's, like, being open about his... Uh, um, his dodgy side I guess and the fact that he's got his own child if you've got a child that's similar age you might be more inclined to be like look I've got to do anything I can to help because God help it it could be my child you know maybe he likes the area he obviously lives there doesn't he uh, visits there regularly his mom's there so maybe he likes the area and he wants the area to be seen in a positive light if my local town had a child abduction I'd want to be on the streets helping as a conscientious local person you know so there's reasons why for both sides you can see he's smells fishy and seems seedy but you can also see why he might behave in this way his mother set up a desk near the tapas restaurant in order to gather and give out information about madeline we don't know if this woman's actions are philanthropic in nature or if she's hoping to keep well informed of all the information circulating about the case you know maybe she's just a gossip or maybe she's got a darker reason for wanting that information members of the british agency child exploitation and online protection center take a close interest in murat and work to develop his psychological profile so they're on this. If that's him holding Madeline, they need to monitor all his contacts. The characteristics of the building made his computer display. Imp um, technicians arrived from Great Britain with sophisticated equipment capable of detecting the presence of people inside a building. Unfortunately, they can't do that with this building. So they stick to the investigations and conventional tailing. They follow him. They discover his relationship with a married woman. So he has got a seed, you know, he's in a relationship with a married woman. Again, less likely to be a paedophile if he's having a sexual relationship with someone grown up. You know what I mean? And he's trying to hide that. 
but they found it out. They're doing good police work. So they're following this. The couple have got uh, that he's having the affair with, they've got an eight-year-old daughter. They live in Faro. The relationship is strange. Michaela's still living with her spouse. Robert visits them as if it's no big deal. All of them seem happy with the situation. And the little girl, what does she think about it? On May the 12th, the suspect rents a car in which he drives kilometers over rough tracks for basic essentials. He explains later that day his mother needed his car for her information desk. We're assuming he noticed he was being followed. Bit of a strange one again, isn't it? But people can be a bit strange. When we decide to search his residence and the vehicles he uses during the night of May the 13th, the prosecutor and the Republic judge go to the court where in view of the growing suspicion and the urgency of the situation, a search warrant is issued. Jane Tanner formally recognises Robert Murat. Before the search, we want to assure ourselves that Jane Tanner recognises himself, recognises him as the individual. She's sitting inside an unmarked car whose windows allow her to see out without being spotted. Robert Murat, anonymous amongst plainclothes police officers, goes up the road in the same way as the alleged abductor. Jane Tanner is adamant. It's definitely him that she saw that night. She recognises his way of walking. But does he resemble the description she painted previously? The investigator with Murat is on friendly terms. They're with him in a bar till two in the morning. They're not going to relax surveillance. As soon as he gets home, the police officers will monitor all entrances to his house. For the moment, they've no evidence against Murat, only suspicions. If they'd been certain Madeline was in the house, they wouldn't have had to wait to daylight, they'd have been in there. Uh, they search for evidence, two rainwater recovery tanks are explored, they pack up items of clothing to a laboratory, laptops are seized, and they find a cutting from a British newspaper that refers to a case of paedophilia. That's a bit weird to make a cutting, isn't it? A, a cutting of a newspaper. But remember what I said, it's all over the papers all the time leading up to Madeline's disappearance. So they find this newspaper cutting, which is a bit weird. Again, Robert Murat's weird, isn't it? It's weird. Robert Murat is placed under investigation and interviewed at the offices of the police. He does not wish for the lawyer. He doesn't want a lawyer. He's the first suspect who will be declared Arguido. That's the Portuguese term for suspect. As such, he benefits from certain rights, one of them the right to remain silent, but he does not assert that right. He responds to all questions put to him. That's either stupidity, because we see a lot of uh, um, true crime witness interviews, police interviews on YouTube, and quite often they don't ask for a lawyer even when they're guilty. And quite often they answer questions even when they're guilty. So that could be innocence or guilt. If you were innocent, you might be more likely to look for a lawyer because you'd be so angry at the idea that you'd be put under suspicion that you demand a lawyer. I'm not having this. I want to be let free. I'm innocent. You know, so but also if you're involved in the investigation, the police have been with you all this time. Maybe it's been explained to him. Look, it's looking a bit fishy for you. You can understand why, can't you? You're on the route. Someone said it was you. <laughs> so we're going to have to interview you as if you're a suspect. Are you OK with that? And he might just go, yeah. So I don't know. Despite obvious nervousness, nervousness, his statements are clear and precise. We ask about the reasons for his arrival. The hypothesis of abduction is considered. Murat could have entrusted the observation to an accomplice who would have chosen Madeline and observed the parents' habits. We want to know more about his friends. So he remembers having heard a siren after 10.30pm. He was then in the kitchen with his mother the next morning around 9 o'clock. He asked a passerby what happened and that's how he learned about Madeline's disappearance. He then decided to go and ask offer his help all his immediate state all his statements are immediately checked they check the places he stays he went to with Michaela they look for CCTV and they'd like to compare them with the description they ask him about a telephone call intercepted after the announcement of his disappearance of the disappearance his response is very vague we know that towards 11 30 Michaela phoned Murat he then called a certain Sergei Malinka and straight afterwards Michaela We'll never know the content of the conversations. No one will give us plausible explanations. The answers are evasive. I no longer remember. Or that was about the website for the estate agency. Sergei Malinka is Russian, aged 23, works with computers and lives with his parents 300 metres from the Ocean Club. His mother, a housewife, is employed by a cleaning company that does certain apartments for the club. He's seeing a young Portuguese woman. 
He boasted about having sexual relations with a minor in 2006. So all this is really fishy, isn't it? Really fishy. Interviewed, he refutes the allegations, claiming it's vengeance on the part of his associate. Unhappy with the way they shared, their shared company worked out. Again, totally fishy. Murat and Michaela intended to open an estate agency together. It was to discuss... Like, so they met Sergey to discuss the, a get-together at the Ocean Club on May the 2nd. And Luis Antonio was seen in the area. Was he watching his wife? The speculation had, is hardly credible since he seemed to accept his wife's relationship with Murat. On May the 14th, the home and vehicles belonging to Michaela and Luis Antonio are searched. The couple are interviewed in the afternoon. Michaela hints that she suspects her husband, Luis Antonio, as a person responsible for maintaining swimming pools, has great access to a number of hotels or private residences spread throughout the area. Certain buildings are closed for a good part of the year, but in spring the pools are prepared before the summer season. Searches are ordered of all the residences concerned without success. No trace anywhere of Madeline. We're back to square one. So what's good, though, is that the police are having a good dig around, aren't they? Uh, I quickly need to refill my drink. Then we're going to finish this bit about Robert Murat, and then we're going to give some money to charity. So stick around for this. Ah, I need to wet the whistle. Oosh. Been a bit of coming and going as well. We had a plumber in the house doing a bit of a quoting job while I've been doing this, so things going on. All good in the hood, all good in the hood. We'll reiterate, actually, I, I want to reiterate that uh, I was wrong yesterday to be so flippant about Madeleine Armacan's death, and it's sad that she's dead, and we're going to be giving some money to charity, you know, on our behalf, on behalf of the tippies that got donated, and also, you know, in memory of her, in a way, at the end of this episode, so... Uh, no words on stream maybe today because this is what we're doing this week. Whatevs. On May the 14th, the vehicles are searched. Michaela and Luis Antonio are searched. The couple are interviewed. And they talk about these swimming pool things. The discovery of a key at Murat's house revives the hope of finally getting a lead. He tells us it belongs to Michaela and it must have been dropped accidentally. Where was that key before it was found in his house? In Michaela's pocket? In her bag? We learn it opens the door of a garage where Luis Antonio stores his maintenance products. A team is sent immediately to the part of Lagos where the garage is situated. The search proves as disappointing as the others. Nothing is found, and once again, no evidence of Madeline's presence. A couple of points of conjecture here. One is that if this Murat was involved in helping them hide Madeline, or dis you know help helping someone steal Madeline, then you're unlikely to find the evidence in these places because they will have cleaned it up, won't they? They're, they're, if you're criminal and you're doing criminal things, you're careful about trying to cover your tracks, aren't you? Unless it's like you're drunk and you're randomly doing something. But the idea that it's um, without... Uh, what am I trying to say? The idea that uh, Madeleine and McCann's parents are innocent if this person is proved to be involved isn't correct is it because this this person lives in the area has been in the area maybe even has met i mean i don't know i don't know but maybe could be helping i don't know you know i don't know they could be so you can see why the police are so interested in digging this one over 
and why they're not going to just say, all right, this guilty, that, that. They, they really want to get to the bottom of it. They need evidence. For the profilers, Murat is the guilty party. Since Murat's first interview, which they attended, the specialists have continued to refine the profile of the suspect. Of course, suspect, assuming that Adeline was abducted. Assuming that. They've heard about the statement from one of his so-called childhood friends, put on file by the police department. According to him, Murat had an affirmed penchant for bestiality. He recounted his attempts at relations with a cat and dog. It's a bit fucked up. So Murat, again, is coming out to be a right weirdo. Subsequently killed, he states, with cruelty. Moreover, he alleged to... I'm not going to read that out on, but... Um, he alleged crimes on his 16-year-old cousin. The individual describes Murat as someone violent with behavioural problems, a pervert, a sadist, a mythanthropist. We're all somewhat sceptical. All the same, according to the English profilers, there's a 90% chance he's the guilty party. That seems to us to be too easy. We think that drawing conclusions based essentially on the statement of an ex-convict is rather dangerous. Where are you on that? I don't know. It's hard because we weren't there, but I think the leader of the investigation from the Portuguese side is seeming to say, this is a bit too easy. This is a bit too, you know, it all seems a bit too obvious. The English profilers say it's 90% chance him. And, you know, let's examine some ideas. If we're covering up Madeleine's death and the English people are involved in the cover up because it sells newspapers, makes millions of pounds and they're all involved. Now, if that's part of it, then they would probably want you to investigate someone who could not be proven to be, you know, so you could never really know. So there'd always be these questions, wouldn't there? Um, but they're 90% sure already, whereas the police in Portugal are not 90% sure. They've done a lot of digging, found a lot of fishy stuff, which is good because it shows they really are digging. The um, affair that this guy's having with this woman, the strange relationship they have, the strange phone calls, which is probably something that they don't want the police to know about. I don't know what. You know, maybe when the police start sniffing around the area, imagine you live in the area, right? And you've got, I don't know, a load of stolen goods in a garage or you're dealing drugs or something like that, yeah? Something a little bit dodge. And the police all turn up <laughs> and they're searching through all the area because they want to find this little girl. You would immediately call your friend and say, look, we've got to move that stuff out of that garage. That's got to go can't have that big box of drugs in that garage. Do you know what I mean? Or whatever it is. That's got to go. Do you know what I mean? Because you'd think you'd be worried, wouldn't you? So there are other reasons that you could add it up for him to be totally dodgy, but to not be part of the crime. And the fact that he's involved, he's a double-edged sword in terms of his helping, because he might be legitimately trying to help or he might be trying to gather information and that might be because he's involved in the crime. Or it might be because someone's paying him to gather information. You know, you don't know what's going on, and nor do the police. So they're sus, right? They're sus of it all. But for the profilers from England, it's Murat all the way. It's Murat all the way. Since Murat's first interview, when they attended, the specialists have continued to refine the profile. But that's the English profiles. The Portuguese police say the statement of an ex-convict is rather dangerous. As if the memory of the McCann family's friends suddenly came back to them all. Rachel Mampilli, wife of Matthew Oldfield, Fiona Payne, wife of David Payne, and Russell O'Brien, Jane Tanner's partner, recall having seen Murat on the night of May the 3rd. Shortly after the announcement of the disappearance in the immediate vicinity, apartment 5A. Again, my conjecture here. Again, me just talking around a subject. Not saying anything specific that's going to get me binned off the internet. But if you were, I don't know, let's say you were, a professional of some sort, maybe a doctor, maybe a surgeon. I'm not going to talk so specifically about Jerry and Kate. You know, maybe you're an ear, ear specialist. <laughs> you find your daughter dead. It's an accident. You maybe sedated her. Maybe she banged her head. Maybe she jumped on that sofa. Whatever. She's choking on her own vomit. You do the CPR. It doesn't work. I might say to my wife, listen, there's nothing you could do. It wasn't your fault. It's an unhappy accident. It's We believe in God, don't we? And God's done this to us. God works in mysterious ways. I don't know what the fuck's going on, but we tried our hardest. We're doctors. We tried to keep alive. You don't need to suffer over this. It's not your fault. It's horrible and it's sad, but it's not your fault, first thing. Second thing, you might say, but if we tell the police immediately, they might take our kids off us. And you know what? All those other people that are at dinner with us, like they were supposed to be checking on her for fuck's sake. They didn't spot anything. 
You might grab one of them in and say, look, did you fucking see her lying on the floor? No, I didn't. Well, why didn't you? You're supposed to be checking on her. You might be throwing some accusations around. We're all going to lose our kids over this, you fucker. We're all going to lose our kids over this. Might be thrown around. And if that was the case, you might say, you know what? I don't want to lose my kids. I didn't do anything wrong. I'm not at fault. Like, Kate might be saying this to, to her husband. I don't know. You know, I don't know. Don't want to lose my kids. But um, we're going to have to cover this fucking thing up. And it's done now. And there's nothing you can do about it to make it better. So the best outcome is that we don't lose our kids. I just think there may have been some motivation on the part of a, maybe not even a guilty parent. You know, maybe someone who's just irresponsible or whatever. I'm just often conjecture like the policeman is trying to think about ideas in the case, you know. And then from that point on, you're all sort of complicit then, aren't you? You might not think it's a good idea. You might think, I don't know about this, or maybe we should tell the truth. But you might worry that you're going to lose your kids. You might worry there's going to be some other consequence. You might have been offered money, I don't know. But once it's happened once, like one day, once one day has passed and the story is out and it's that story and you were interviewed and you said what you said, the minute you start to change your story and go back on it and say, actually, look, here's the real truth. Oh, it's even worse, isn't it? It's even harder to do that, even more difficult. So when something comes up like, a suspect you might think fucking thank god for that yeah i saw him <laughs> you know that might happen mightn't it might after the announcement of the disappearance jane tanner's partner recalled seeing we were out on the may the third and all of a sudden so did everyone else now M meanwhile of course murat's picture has been shown on television and in the newspapers. They themselves were in direct contact with him during the previous days. However, it's only on May 16th they deliver this information to us. As for the officers of the National Guard who were on the spot, they didn't see him in that night, only the next morning when he came to offer his services as an interpreter. So it's a bit weird. On July the 3rd, 11th at 10 a.m., a confrontation is organized between the witnesses. Confrontation is organised between the witnesses, Rachel Mampilly, Fiona Payne and Russell O'Brien, and Robert Murat. Nothing new comes of it. The former persists in stating the suspect was definitely in the area the night of the disappearance, which he did live in the area just down the road, didn't he? That's why they, he's been... Remember, the whole reason he's become under this suspicion, having volunteered himself as an interpreter the day of her disappearance, having volunteered to help find her the day of her disappearance, he's come under some suspicion because the chief of police that's running the case has walked the route of this potential abductor. Jane Tanner said she saw someone walking down this road with a child in her arms. I'm going to walk down this road and see what I come to. This house looks suspicious. Who's living here? This chap. He's come forward already. Oh, has he? That's strange. He was involved in our process now. Now all this stuff's coming out. He's on the news. He's in the thing. Jane Tanner's certain it's him. All her friends are certain it's him. They now remember definitely this guy. Definitely this guy. Murat denies the whole thing and even accuses them of lying. It's hard to know, isn't it? If you had any video of this, it'd be easier to break it down, but it's one man's word against an entire group's word. So they're all pretty sure he's saying they're lying. So if it turns out to be Murat, it's Murat. If it turns out not to be, we've got a problem. Because if it turns out not to be him, they've all said something that wasn't true. He said they said it wasn't true. Like That would be a big issue, wouldn't it? That would be huge if that happened. So Each side stands its ground. The only positive aspect of this meeting, the McCann's friends, are they undertake to return to Portugal for the purpose of the investigation. So the only positive aspect of this meeting is that the McCann's friends say they're going to come back to Portugal and help the investigation, but they don't. That will not happen. So that will lead us on to Chapter 8, which we will pick up tomorrow. We'll finish off with a look at these cadaver dogs again. Um, we'll do the money to UNICEF. So um, I'll get the cadaver dogs up. Madly Ein McCann cadaver dogs. Because the Portuguese did a really good thorough investigation, didn't they? And so these cadaver dogs go around the apartment that the McCanns... Uh, and we want to look at some of these interviews as well. 
You know, you want to look at some of these interviews. It's raining again. Um, I thanks, Tippy Snippies. And then flush. Thank you for your Tippy Snippies. I have to get this Tippy's page. Good stream. The last stream gave you O2 anxiety. Yeah, I didn't like playing that game yesterday on my B side stream. On the B side of this channel, we've got another channel called Battery Exhausted. You find it by going to this channel and then the playlists, sorry, the channels, um, Battery Exhausted. And last night we ended up doing, I wanted to play Chuffin Subnautica. I played it. I was in a bad mood by the end of it. It fucked me off. I had to keep going up for oxygen. I had to keep going up for oxygen. It was annoying. I died loads of times. So it put me in a bad mood. And then we reacted to this uh, gambling, um, Twitch gambling bloke who stole loads of money. So we had a B-side stream last night on Battery Exhausted for what good it was. <laughs> but thank you for the tippies. Thank you for the tippies. Um, have I tried Abzu? No stress. Okay, I'll have a look at that. That's what we need. A no stress ocean exploration game. We totally need that sort of thing. So thank you very much for the big tippies. Thank you very much. Um, we'll, we'll give a chunk of this to the uh, to the UNICEF now. Um, but I will keep some of that as well because like, it's my tippies, thank God, for my eating as well. So, um, And the suggestion about the, the game, you know, I might need to buy it. So I, I didn't promise all of my tippies. <laughs> but if you tip me and say it's for UNICEF, I'm giving that to UNICEF. So no worries there. I'm sure everyone understands. So now we've got the cadaver dogs. This is like, you know, this isn't fake news. This is the reality. They search around the cars, they search around the apartment. So we'll have a look at that. And in another window, I'm going to um, open up UNICEF and set it up. And then I'll show you that I've donated. Because I can't do it online, because obviously you'll see my bank details and stuff like that. But uh, UNICEF. And if that was a cadaver dog and that was your car, you'd be fucking shitting it, wouldn't you? You'd think, what the fuck? Why is this cadaver dog? Cadavers being dead bodies, of course. Why is this dead body indicative? What's wrong with my car? How come I'm... You know, why is... What? This is their hire car that the McCann's used some months after... Or weeks after Madeline's death. Uh, single donation. We'll do the 39. They've got options here. I'll show you. This is UNICEF. They've got options here. Look, 75, 39, 25. I think I will do the 39, yeah. It's a good it's a good middle ground there. Includes the tippies we got today. And it means that of, of the tippies we got today, I get to keep some of it. But I'm, I'm telling you, this is my job. You know, if people tippy me for doing my job, I'm going to keep the, some of the money. But if you tip me and say, this goes to charity, I'll give it to charity. I think I'm doing right there. I don't think I need to reiterate that again, do I? I think we're okay with that. Yes, please keep some snips says. So, you know, she's the one that gave it me, so... I do feel a little bit like anything that comes in during this broadcast I should give to this, but my actual principle is that 2.5% of my income goes to charity, so that's my principle anyway, so um, this is what we're doing anyway. Madly I'm McCann, the sniffer dogs now in her apartment, look. Good dogs these are, they're brought in to do good investigations. And I've got to fill in my details again. It's remembered some of them. Uh, postcode. That's my address. I won't say it out loud. <laughs> yes, I'm over 18. No thanks for emails. Con continue to payment. And you can boost my donation. I'll just show you what's going on while it's going on. Look, they're around the sofa, those dogs. Those dogs really like that sofa, don't they? Um, we're giving the donation of 39. Yes, I'm going to claim gift aid. And I'm going to use PayPal to check out. So you probably won't see my PayPal while I do this, hopefully. I'm really hoping. Login. I mean, obviously, I don't want to have my bank details on the internet. PayPal balance. Great British pounds. Make this the preferred way to pay. Continue to review order. You can't see it here. This is good. And... Should go through now. Thank you. It's on the way. There you go. We've done a little bit on Madeline's behalf there, on your behalf. Thank you for the tippies. Thank you for the donations. We try and do this every Wednesday, and we haven't done it for a few weeks, so we've given them a little chunk there. I think that's good. Uh, and as a handler, I can pick up his um, 
body language, etc. And it would appear to me that as soon as he's come in the in the house, um, he's picked up a scent that he recognises. The second dog that we've seen work today is the crime queen dog, Keela. Um, she will only indicate to me when she's found human blood. This is massive, isn't it? I shouldn't have the sun logo on. I should move that. Look at the dog indicating. This was the problem they had. Is that at this point over here, where the victim recovery dog was indicated, um, as you saw on the video. The crime scene dog has actually given me um, what we call a passive indication where she freezes in this spot here, which would indicate to me that there is some human blood there. So during the crime scene search, which they videoed, the dog indicated there was some human blood. They took swabs of that, sent it to the lab, and it came back as DNA positive McCann, female line, either Kate or Madeline, or one of her other, she's had other daughters. She's got one of the daughters, obviously she had the twins. So, um... Your man and his dog went on to work for the FBI after this, right? Look at that. That's cool. Um, so it, there was a problem here. There's a little loophole, which is that we know that they said there was blood. The dog did, right? We took a swab of it. We sent it off to the lab. It came back DNA positive McCann. In Portugal, the lab does not send back a report that says DNA positive McCann, human blood. It says fluid. It's a little loophole it's little lettering in the law you know it doesn't say what kind of fluid it could have been any fluid the dog said it was blood the report said it was fluid when they put that report into the court case into the evidence and all that it turns out that you are not allowed to legally in court say madeline's blood was found on the walls despite madeline's blood or the the blood indicated by the dog that contained the dna of a mccann you know, you're not allowed to say it's Madeline's blood was found on the walls. It could have been Kate's. It could could have been Kate's. We are sure it's blood because we've seen this man with his dog indicate that it's blood. But when the report comes back, it doesn't say blood because the processing just says DNA fluid. So that was a, an issue that prevented two and two being put together and making four and being really obvious to everyone that clouded the 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 vision in some ways. But obviously this dog has indicated human blood. Who's human blood? We don't know. Until they sample it and send it off to the lab and it comes back DNA positive McCann. But at that point, you have to stop calling it blood, legally and officially, because the dog is not an official indication of blood. It's an idea that you have to put testing with, and the testing goes through the lab. And so they did the testing, it came through the lab, it didn't say blood, did it? So it's not blood. No, it didn't say blood, but it could be blood. They can't be certain what it is through the lab test. She will find blood that's historically very old, um, and she will find anybody's blood, any human blood, uh, which is important to make sure that everybody knows. Uh, so he's clear. We don't know that's Madeline's blood. We need to put it through the tester. Um, the fact that it, there's um, uh, other scientific methods being used may stop you recovering any DNA, um, but if you try, um, we'll see what happens. Um, but she is very, very good, and when she indicates, there is always blood there. So there you go. That was the cadaver dog indicating that there was blood at the scene of Madeleine McCann's disappearance. And as I state in my conjecture, conjecture, naughty me, but, you know, I found out a bit of stuff uh, from reading this book. And also, I'm pretty sure it's fact, you know, I'm pretty sure it's fact that they sent off those fluids and they came back as um, Madeleine McCann DNA. Um, if I just quickly search Google, because I want to be sure. Um, McCann DNA evidence. Uh, the blood found in the McCann's car is that of Madeline, as well as those samples detected in the flat, the paper said. Kate and Jerry McCann, who are official suspects, deny any involvement. So... It's been reported in the media. This is the Sydney Morning Herald. Um, a British newspaper reported it. So I have heard it. You know, I'm not just saying it out of nowhere. 
but the definitive tests leave no doubts for the police. The blood in the McCann's car is that of Madeline. But like I said, I'm also of the opinion that when it goes through to the court, they, they, the police, are really sure, but legally they can't say it's blood. They can only say it's fluid because the DNA test proves it's DNA, and that DNA can come from any kind of fluid. The DNA test does not prove it's blood. So um, the cadaver dog indicates that. This was during the process, you know, when suspects are being named and stuff. So there you go, that's evidence of that. Why the UK lab failed to solve critical McCann DNA samples? Uh, I don't want to agree to this, so I'm just going to skim through it a bit. Um, We look at the question that's being asked. You can't really see this behind this cookies thing, but it says, we look at the question that's being asked and Dr. Lowe, you know, answered the particular question. The question that lab was asked was, is there DNA from Madeline on the swab? So they answered that question. They didn't say it's blood or it's this or it's that. They were asked, you know, the DNA results here obtained. Here's the results, look. It would be very simple to say yes because the number of components was in the result, but it could also be a match to one of Madeline's sisters. It's a 50% of Madeline's profile will be shared with each parent, so it's possible that a mixture of two people. So we can't actually determine that this is her DNA. So this was the problem, wasn't it? That reasonable people would say, well, it's either her mom's or hers, and her mom wasn't coughing up blood in the apartment, was she? So, um, you know, but legally, your report has to say that it's not 100% definite Madeline's DNA even. So we cannot answer the question, is the match genuine or is it a chance match? They can't answer it legally. So it doesn't become, you know, important information, evidence in the, co in the case, does it? But looking into it as we are, it seems quite interesting, I would say. Seems quite interesting. So you've got this funny character. He's not been proved. He's not been proved. Uh, tomorrow we're going to pick up a man with a child in his arms. We run through rethinking the facts, the analysis of the crime scene which we're looking at with those cadaver dogs, the hypothesis of death being considered. And I imagine then one more episode will get us through the McCann's bedroom and putting the McCann's under investigation and the dismissal of the head of the investigation, which finally ended this guy's investigation and part in it, which is why he wrote this fucking book, which the McCann's tried to ban, which they have failed to have banned. And sad, sad, sad things because what we're really saying is that we think that she's not still alive which is the most sad thing and i will agree yesterday i was a bit flippant about it so hello rudy and the dogs you're back in the room uh you've only missed us donating to the unicef you've only missed us donating the money to the unicef mate um hopefully we can help some kids who are still out there you know hopefully we can do some good in the world for that because uh, unicef is the united nations international children's emergency relief fund so the main thing is the big org. I, the reason I trust, I know there's charities and directors and who's got in money out of UNICEF and who's the director and all this probably drive a nice car, don't they? But really, you know, like they do a lot and they're very above board and you can see their stuff happening in the world. So I'm happy with that one. Uh, I'm open to other suggestions for other charities as well. I'm open to that as well. So that's today's episode. I am going to quickly, while I'm at it, take, because I've got tippies, and Snippy suggested this game, so I want to have a look at it. Because I'm battery exhausted, the B-side channel. We're trying to do late night B-side streams. <laughs> like me chilling quietly, playing a game, talking quietly. Different from this personality researched in, you know, pre presentational media. Um, and a bit more just chilling. And uh, I'm trying to find chill games. We also play Genshin Impact on stream, of course. So you'll see on this channel Genshin Impact videos. We play that on Twitch, though. So it's not live on this channel. If you're not interested, don't watch it. If you are interested, watch it. It's quite fun. It's got a story. There's loads of stuff going on. And just like we do in all episodes, I take tangents. So you never know what's going to happen. So the variety will keep coming. And the Madeline McCann thing will be a big feature of this week. And then hopefully, you know, there's some things in life that I've wanted to say for years. Do you know what I mean? Like everyone's got an opinion on this shit, haven't they? The Madeline McCann stuff and... You know, I watched all the videos like you have with the Richard D. Hall and I want to sort of, um, you know, I, I don't know when's the right time to like make an episode about Madeleine McCann. Like, when's the right time to do that? Well, this week is because it's been proven that it's not libel or slander. They've done the court challenge. So it seems like right that this should be the time to do it. 
and then we never have to talk about it again. But there will be a few other of these sort of episodes, I'm sure. Like you've got a lot that you've been suggesting in chat as well, and um, it comes under the ballpark of conspiracy theory that we cover, doesn't it? You know, it comes under that ballpark that over, you know, because there's a lot of conspiracies revolving around Madeleine on McCann. And me personally, I'd like to try and draw people back down to earth and say, look at what the lead investigator thinks. Could that be the right truth? You know, could that be the truth? And then it will also lead us in at the end of the week to some of the more interesting videos of them talking in interviews and looking at the psychology because they are really good videos. And Rich Hall's done a very good job on some of those. So well worth us taking a look. Uh, the game then that's been suggested and if you've got any other oh sean atwood is currently doing a live about madeline Arne's case well there you go great minds think alike but fools rarely differ <laughs> sean a wonderful person in my opinion who's done a lot of good work on the internet but has also trodden the wrong side of that shady line of talking a load of bollocks sometimes with people who talk a load of bollocks and i know he's doing it for views you know i know he's doing that and i know he's anti-establishment i know that but i think if you know misses the mark a few times i think the sad thing is the case is that his anchor has sadly died you know wild man has sadly died rest in peace wild man a great man in many ways and i think wild man was more of an anchor for him and would bring him back down to earth when necessary and i think since wild man's death sean's been um you know like a helium balloon let go in the wind he's buffeted around by different ideas and forces sometimes but lots of interested um lots of interesting things on the channel so you know, not awful not awful and certainly all the true crime stuff where we discovered him in the first place all the true crime stuff very interesting you know very good podcasts with interesting guests um yeah so i'm just going to quickly search for a game now which is a bit abzu okay Let's have a little look on the old internet. Because this is what I thought... This is probably what I thought we were going to be doing with Subnautica. Ocean exploration. I didn't know that in Subnautica I'd have to go up to the surface for air every 30 seconds and that all the fish would try and kill me. <laughs> but maybe this looks much more relaxing and calm. Look. Yeah, this might be more sort of the thing. good suggestion used to like Atwood but not so keen of late yeah it's he's diluted his core unique selling point you know talking to those um, I mean the world's changed hasn't it because the people who were on his podcast started making their own podcasts and trying to um, ride that thunder and the joke is that they're not media producers really and nor is Sean really but Sean at least has employed some decent media producers to help him but uh, between them you know Sean's more like a producer who puts up the money and has the ideas and then the people on the streams provide the content. Well, now people have realised they can make their own content. You know, you've got Darren G doing his own channel. You've got Billy Moore doing his own channel. And they all want to be a podcaster. They'll never rise to the same status as Sean because I don't think they quite have it in them. I don't think they quite realise what it takes and what content... You know, content creation, media production is quite a big su su subject, really. And having a few good stories to tell isn't all everything. But... Um, what Sean, I suppose, has done, and I think, again, um, his jailhouse vlog, right? Yeah, that's way back. Um, what he's done is he's moved away from this sort of uh, unique selling point, the thing that made him successful. And, of course, at some point, he's going to finish talking about that, isn't he? He's going to finish with things to say, wild man's dead, you know, that's the past. But uh, moving into this whole conspiracy world, I know he thinks it's... I think he doesn't believe everything, and it's alternative media equals views, you know, equals, um, but I don't know what his perception on the whole COVID thing was. I don't think it was very healthy. Um, you know, you start to fragment your audience. The minute you start doing something contentious, like we do these things, and hopefully I don't come down heavy on any particular side, although in this one I am sort of leaning in towards what the detective has said, but hopefully I leave the world open and we make friends. Like a lot of you here are friends because I had a poke at, something that you like Martin Leaker's ideas and whilst you might have agreed with some of his ideas I didn't have a poke at you you know I'm not going to poke at you but I think that Sean has this problem of uh, like reasonable people like you and I you and me me and you um, have been into his podcast and then he's done this one that's been like what the fuck's that 
why the fuck have you got him on or her on or what the fuck are you doing with this woman you know and like there are some weird people that turn up and then you start thinking well Sean's not got a filter he doesn't really he's not choosing the right guests here and you just leave it alone a couple of times I've actually unsubscribed because someone has said something that I've been so I guess politically or ethically against and I've thought no fuck that I'm not having this I'm not watching this shit and I've turned it off and I've unsubscribed a number of times then I've gone back and said you know what I'm not cross anymore today I'll see what he's saying today oh that's all right today and then it goes off the fucking deep end again and I think oh fuck this Sean I'm not subscribing to this so I think he actually switched off some of his early uh, adopters and uh, Darren G is very similar like Darren G has spoken some real sense and then done some really childish things and then said some stuff that makes you think he's like looped off the planet like about the moon god and the sun god and like all religion is to the sun and like you know talking these weird and it's because they're into this alternative media and if you haven't got a good filter yourself then you're going to see a lot of weird shit in this alternative media and because it's alternative and unregulated you know all the fake news can go on there so oh it's good because no one's shutting google's not shutting me down i can speak my mind but it's also not good because everyone else that doesn't want to be shut down is there and they're not all telling the truth <laughs> So he's in this ballpark now with a load of other weird shit, isn't he, Sean? Yeah. I haven't really followed. Since the podcast wars, I've sort of been switched off by them, you know, since the podcast wars. I used to be a bit of a follower of Darren G. But again, like, I can't listen to him going on about one week going on about licking minges and the next week going on about how his daughter's going to be raised Muslim so she doesn't have any men look at her legs. Like, you know, one week he's the king of licking minges and the next week it's absolutely um, ethically incorrect to be licking minges so or even talking about it on the internet which he did last week and and i i oh, just i used to like him just because like, he had a down-to-earth perception having been through the legal system about knife crime you know he had a message put down the knives cow on the cook but he does get a bit like he just needs to calm the fuck down like darren g i just wish he had his like he's done his time now I'll forgive him his past indiscretions, having done his time. I'll treat him like a you know fair, clean slate. But like, just calm the fuck down, mate. Calm the fuck down. Stop yelling and screaming about everything, and jump into these like quite extreme conclusions and get inside. Calm the fuck down. Get back down on planet Earth. You know, get back. To- Sometimes I think he's losing his marbles a little. He's a psycho. You say, yeah, like. You don't see everything on the internet. I'm not going to be diagnosing anyone on the internet. And there's lots of reasons why I have respect for him and his cause. Uh, You've got to bear in mind that someone like Darren could have come out of prison and gone straight back into organised crime. You know? Like, he could be over by now, couldn't he? He could be dead. So there are reasons... Like, we're never going to rehabilitate criminals if we don't open our arms to the rehabilitation process. And whilst our process is not perfect, I think Darren, more than anyone, would benefit from a little bit of help. And maybe the sort of people in his life that he's lost over the years because of his being in prison and, you know, criminal behaviour or never gained because of it. But, you know, someone who can keep you grounded and just keep you on that straight path and keep you on the track and uh, not fill your head with a load of fucking nonsense. Not even if he, you know, in the dead of night you want to think about all these ideas and philosophies in the morning you get up and you go to the gym instead it's not about like you know major nonsense and i think that's very much down i think in the morning when he's at the gym he's probably a much more normal down to earth switched on um interesting person than he is in the evening when he's letting his ideas go i don't know i don't know uh yeah obviously he's no you know he's been a naughty boy hasn't he yeah i mean he said it himself on the internet as well and i understand all that um if he's not persisting with being naughty now i'll just quickly show you these people on the internet who we're talking about for anyone else um sean atwood is podcaster and former uh former drug dealer who went to prison in america for a few years for dealing drugs and then came back to england and told his story on a podcast in some books did some talks at schools and that led to him uh finding infamy as a podcaster so some of his podcasts have become infamous and his friend Wildman, he did a bit with um, True Geordie, you know, he's an internet person now. And so that's Sean Atwood. 
RIP Wildman. And Darren G has had about 50 different web uh, YouTube channels. The current one is this one. And a bit more of a wild, you know, a bit more of a wild, um, wild child in many ways. Has been through the police system because of drug dealing and um, shootings and come out isolated from his previous peer group. Um, went on Sean Atwood's podcast, told his story and gained some notoriety. Ended up making YouTubes himself, Twitch, TikToks, whatever, TikToks and YouTubes. And um, sometimes, like I say, can say some very interesting, very balanced things about knife crime. And other times can say some very off the wall things about whatever and get himself into some real situations. So um, a bit of a polarizing character. I would say a bit of a polarizing character. At times I've got a lot of respect for him and at other times I like I, said, I just think he should just calm the fuck down. Chill the fuck out a bit. Calm down. Calm down. Calm down. <laughs> um Genshin's beyond me, you love the music. Yeah, I'll tell you what, Genshin Impact is a really good game. Let's finish on that briefly. This is what we've been doing today. I, can't, I don't ever want to leave. Genshin Impact is a really good game. It's one of these games that's more than you imagine. It's story. They spent. There's, you've never had a game before that's going to be four years in the making, but they're not going to stop producing more and more for it. They're planning ahead. Uh, it's an online service game that plans for a four-year cycle. So it's different from any other game, really. It looks like many other games. You know, you're running around. The environment's really beautiful. The combat's quite simple to understand. My characters have got different personalities, and then we go on these stories with them. Uh, and I make the entertainment in the episode by being myself, though, and I have a bit of a laugh. Um, but it always it keeps amazing me about how good the game is. And I've played a lot of games in my time. You know, I've played a lot of games. This music sounds so good. I'll tell you what, they've recently made new music and what they do is they don't just fuck about i'll tell you what they don't fuck about what they do is they get uh one of them was the london symphonic orchestra here this one might be a different orchestra this oh yeah, this is the london symphonic orchestra so like we're talking about the top top people aren't we getting the London Symphonic Orchestra. Like, they're not just some people playing saxophones for your game music. Top end. All of it has got this level of depth and artistry about it. Top end. Uh, in a way as well, it's the most expensive video game ever because um, they're spending more money on the production of Genshin Impact than anyone's ever spent on a computer game. And they're getting it back. There is a gacha system. You get your characters through loot crates, through like rolling for them. Uh, you don't always get you what, what you want. It's like a kinder egg. But uh, as long as you're happy with never spending any money, it's also free to play. <laughs> and that blew my mind. And I intended to just play it for a bit and make a review. But uh, instead of that, I've played it forever and ever and ever. <laughs> no reviews, just uh, an entire channel has come of it because now we've got Ganji Cuts, which is an edit channel for things that go on on Twitch that you might not have seen on YouTube. I'll edit them out. Little, you know, I did half an hour talking about this. I did half an hour looking at the GoldenEye trailer. I had the Queen died and I reacted to it. So these are all things that are in the Genshin Impact episodes. But if you're not into that, you can just go on this channel and I've cut out the little bits for you. But a lot of it is Genshin Impact related now. And I'm really lucky because the community, as far as I can see, is not toxic whatsoever. They're really nice and they're supporting this videos they're watching some of these videos they're interested they've got opinions and it's helping me to grow as a streamer i like growing in different areas i like the fact that we're doing this here daytimes ganji kid the same channel of course is home to all uploads from twitch so you will see genshin impact there if you don't like it, you don't have to watch it i'm not not stressed this is a, a variety channel that's the whole point you'll see a variety here and it'll bring in different people from all different places, hopefully. And that'll be hopefully really good because that's something I'm thinking, you know, a bigger aim. You've got people in chat. Sometimes it could be an echo chamber. I've heard this about social media. If we can bring in different people from different places to different parts of the stream, we can share different ideas. It might actually be a good thing, mightn't it? it might be a good thing. So um, you're having a chat, you're fine. Uh, playing Tiger Woods PGA. I remember Tiger Woods PGA. Do you remember the... You had to, um, this was golf, right? This was golf. 
got a controller here, right? I'm on the keyboard and mouse these days. Do you remember when this was golf? You'd do that, wouldn't you? <laughs> oh, shit. You've got to make it go back and then up as straight as possible. Or was it the one where you press that to let the thing go around and that to stop and then you swing and that to hit the ball? That one used to annoy me. That was golf. And then you had these controller sticks and you, you hold it back and you've got to smoothly move through. And if you do a little wobble, it shows it on screen as a little wobble and your ball goes off in the... the like, it's more difficult than real golf doing that. But they're trying, aren't they? They're trying. These days, I bet it's fucking virtual reality swing your hockey stick at the computer. Like, what up? Something like that. I don't know. We'll have to investigate because golf's quite relaxing as well. Yeah, but... Computer games, media, I'm into media, and modern media has gone a long, long way. Genshin Impact is something different from a game that you used to buy in a shop and put in your computer. It's something different. It looks very similar on the surface, but deeper down, it's something different. It's, I would almost say it's like Game of Thrones or something that goes on and on and series and episode and episode, except you get more content in Genshin Impact. <laughs> um, if you're into anime and you're into anime, you know, uh, action, anime films... There's that aspect of it as well. Um, there's all sorts, yeah. And it combines information and ideas about our world. And sometimes they talk about ethical things in their quests, which is quite nice as well. You know, there's mirrors to our world. It's a mirror to our world in places, yeah. And also it can just be a bit of silly fun. And we can enjoy the noises the characters make when they're jumping around. So there's all sorts to be said there. It doesn't have to be for everyone. We're going to play other games as well on the B-side channel. Um... And I might even start a playlist here for the B-side channel for anything that was good that went on on the B-side channel on the playlists. Playlists are always here because that's good, isn't it? Playlists. If you like something and you don't want the variety, well, I've, I've separated it all out for you so you can enjoy it separately. <laughs> so we're all good. We're going to do another episode of Madeline McCann tomorrow. Later on this evening, I'm going to be trying out different games on the upstairs setup. Uh, actually, I'll probably be playing Genshin Impact because, you know... I have to do a bit of that and then I can do whatever on the B side. I can literally uh, not worry about the media presentation. Um, although I've got a better microphone now and what have you, um, I can do two things in one stream if I want. I can stop doing Subnautica midstream, say I've had enough of this and do something else like I did yesterday. So anything can happen. It's just for me. I'm chilling on the computer upstairs anyway. I'm playing a game anyway. I might as well stream it, but it's not me being a like you know a personality on stream and having organisation and all my web windows open and you know set up with my buttons. What do you mean set up with your buttons? These buttons that change my camera. Like what what buttons that change your camera? You never told me you had buttons that change the camera. Well, I just I'm doing it now. Now, if anything, oh now, oh so I'm part of it. I didn't ask to be part of it. Well, you are part of it. I mean, you're part of me. I'm the bad part of you. You can't tell me what to do. Uh, I'm not trying to tell you what to do, but if you could just calm down and fuck off while I just finish the episode. Oh, now you want me to calm down and fuck off while you finish the episode? Right, well, I'll tell you, I'll fuck off forever and then you'll never see me again. Well, I would be all right with that because you're the bad part of me, but it would spoil this little bit, wouldn't it? Because when I switch to you, you're not there, are you? Because where are you? You've gone now. Oh, I'm back now, I'm back now. I'll do, I'll do it, I'll do it, I'll do it. It's fine. Right. Right, I think they get the message. I've got buttons and stuff here. Not upstairs. Upstairs, we don't do any of that shit. <laughs> tilted me yesterday, didn't it? Yes, Kelvin. It fucking tilted me off the... You know, it tilted me so far, I slid off the bench and fell onto the floor. Yes, I had to delete it. I, had to, I didn't delete it yet. We might go back and have another look at it. But I had to turn it off. <laughs> Oxygen. Oxygen. I'll just go down here and collect these rocks because I need them for crafting. Oxygen. All right, I'll go up to the surface again. Ah, I've been stung by a fish. I'm dead. Dead now. Oh, I just need sulfur, don't I? I? Just need only one thing. And if I don't find it in the next, what, three minutes, then the game is over because I won't have the time to make the food and I won't have the time to make the... No, I didn't find the sulfur, did I? And then the game was over, yeah. Yeah, o oxygen. Like, Jesus Christ, man. If you want someone to have a nice, fun time, don't put a deadline pressure of 30 seconds on them to return to the surface every time because they won't I've, 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 I don't get me back don't get me back talking about it <laughs> your friend was into manga uh, no one knew what it was he taught himself Japanese so he could read the imports well I wonder if uh, he's still interested because if he'd have been running a business they'd be making some money now because everyone's interested now aren't they it's like a, quite a big thing these days interesting stuff yeah 
Um, so yeah, we're back with Madeline Mayum McCann, Capital K, but we're about to finish this episode and um, I'm going to uh, be back up later. Probably a bit of Genshin Impact, a bit of something else, chilling upstairs later. So you be good, my little podcast. I'll see you tomorrow for some more Madeline Mayum McCann, the book they tried to ban, but they couldn't. You be good. And if you can't be good, <laughs>